don't focus on the weight loss. Focus on all the other positives that you get from slowly increasing your calories and introducing appropriate exercise. Focus on all the other benefits. So you may not see the scale move down real quick at first. Remember, it's kind of a snowball effect, right? If you do this right. Mm -hmm. But what you will, no will notice is you're stronger. Your energy is improving, which is probably something that you're going to enjoy quite a bit considering you have a seven month old. So you probably have gone through like, a period <laughs> yeah. of not that great energy. So it's like, oh my God, I got way more energy. Oh my God, I'm feeling much stronger. My hormones are starting to feel like they're balanced again. My libido is kind of coming back. My sleep is better. My joints feel better. Wow. I'm really enjoying my workouts. And then and focus on those things and you'll, you'll see all the positives that are happening right out the gate. So it's easier to deal with. If you just focus on the weight, well, yeah, that could be real frustrating. And you, and what'll happen is you'll ignore or not to pay attention to or give value to all those other incredible things that happen in the very beginning. And then of course, eventually the weight loss starts to happen. And then it's a snowball effect. It happens faster and faster and faster. And if you do this right, Shannon, it'll feel effortless. What's up, everybody? Here's the giveaway for today's episode, MAPS Aesthetic. This is our core foundational bodybuilding style MAPS workout program. It's free to one of you lucky viewers. Here's what you got to do to win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and click on notifications. Do all those things. And if we like your comment, we'll notify you and you'll get free access to MAPS Aesthetic. Also, we're running a sale right now. We have a workout program bundle that's 50% off and an individual workout program that's 50% off. So here's the bundle. It's the starter bundle. MAPS Anabolic, uh, the Intuitive Nutrition Guide, and MAPS Prime. Those are all in the bundle, 50% off. And then we have a program called MAPS Split. This is a high volume advanced body part split type routine. That program is 50% off. So go check them out and sign up. Go to uh, mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code MAYSPECIAL for the 50% off discount. All right, here comes the show. Here's an interesting muscle building hack. At the end of your workout, do a deep static stretch of the target muscle. Hold it for one to two minutes. Very painful, but it actually triggers muscle growth. Is there a name for this? You know, that's a good question. I know that there's training methodologies that will use this technique. Like, you ever hear of DC training? DC stands for dog crap. You ever hear about this? <laughs> no. no. I'm not making this up. No. There That's was a, what it stands for? I swear to God. So scientific. There's this, no, there was this, <laughs> this bodybuilder uh, guy. I can't remember his name. And on the on a forum, he got real popular. And his forum name was dog crap. So they they called it dog crap training. <laughs> <laughs> this is the industry we're a part yeah. of, you guys. I know. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's why we're doing well. That's oh like, God. <laughs> not hard to dominate an industry when people call themselves dog crap. No, yeah, I'll continue. Uh, all joking aside. It was a, that's the one that I've known of. Um, I know that bodybuilders in the past have incorporated this. Uh, I know Tom Platts uh, would do this at the end of his workouts. Arnold often talked about deep stretching a pump muscle. Studies show that static stretching on its own will elicit a little bit of muscle growth. But after a workout, um, this is mostly anecdote, although there are some studies that show that this is actually true. You get a muscle really pumped and then you you do it like a weighted stretch. Yeah. So a weighted static stretch. Wasn't Ben Pakulski a fan That's of so, yes. yeah. Well, he's interest stretch. Interest stretch. So interset, so, right? Oh, in between sets. Yeah. yeah. So I was going to ask you if the science that supports that is the same science or are they separate? Are it's they the same. Now, here's why, because you guys know this like I do. The reason why I wouldn't do intraset stretching is because a static stretch tends to kind of shut off the CNS a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I could see how bodybuilders going light and just kind of getting a pump would be okay, but I don't want to. Yeah, definitely not strength training. Yeah, I'm not trying to dampen my CNS, but at the end of a workout, I don't care, I'm done. Um, in which case I think it might actually speed up uh, recovery. Well, I imagine I, I, if, if, I rem if I recall, because I did go through this protocol with Ben and I th I think it is, it's interest stretching at the end of like each muscle group. Yes. So like oh yeah. oh I see what you're saying yeah oh. so you I mean so it's like you do all your sets then you stretch yeah, and you move to another one yeah oh that makes okay. sense yeah if I recall that's how it's on I'm, I could be wrong I don't remember I know we actually shot some YouTube videos where he came on and actually did it but what I was curious about is if the the science that you're both using is the same science to support the argument of why this is valuable yeah. is there's there's same? some in, there's some interesting animal studies too where they'll take a, a bird and they'll put like a weight on one of the wings and hold it in a stretch yeah. position and they'll get like very rapid, significant hypertrophy of the stretch muscle. Um, so it's really interesting. And it's not like, I mean, it's it's gnarly. I want people to know this. 
this sucks. Like, yeah. you get like your quad. I did it this morning. My quads super pumped. I did a, a, you know, I worked out my legs. Then I got on a foam roller under my shins so I could kind of sit back on my heels. And I did two minutes sitting there with my quads being pumped. The burn is, it's almost unbearable. It's nasty. Well, it, to me, it really sounds more like it's an isometric tension type stretch. If you're adding load, it's not passive at all. So right. you're still shuttling, you know, blood and, and uh, stimulating the muscles to, to be tense in that position. Right. You're, not, you're, not, you're not resting on a no. joint. So I feel like it's, it is just an isometric hole. I agree. I think that's why it builds muscle. So like, like, let's say you work out your chest, for example, and then you're done. And then you want to, you know, use this technique. You would grab a pair of light dumbbells lay in a fly and allow the dumbbells to come down and really straight and try to relax and allow, and what you'll find is the dumbbells yeah. will fall further and further and further through that minute or two minutes. A minute is probably where most people will want to stop, but I've gone as long as two and three minutes. It is gnarly. Yeah. Then there's some theories around like when a muscle's maximally pumped, stretching it also helps send this kind of uh you know muscle fascia stretching signal, which has also been shown to kind of signal muscle growth. One thing that's cool about this is it doesn't, I don't notice any impairments in, re, in recovery or damage. So it's yeah. like I'm adding something that'll build more muscle, but I, I don't get like more soreness or more fatigued. If anything, I feel like I recover faster. I was going to say, I would, yeah. I would imagine or theorize that it would accelerate that because you get, you get yourself to relax a little bit when you're all super tight and you're pumped. Now yeah. you're in the opposite direction and then you're relaxing the muscle afterwards. Right? Yeah. You know, what's weird about it too is, is uh, like I did this uh, yesterday, I worked out my upper body and I did it at the end of my back workout. So I, I just kind of hung from a bar and tried to relax and let my lat stretch. So I was like really pumped anyway, because I finished my back workout. Then I did this long ass stretch then I let go, and like five seconds later, the pump is way more intense. Oh, it's it's you get this insane pump after the stretch. So I'm gonna have to try that. It's really wild. The only downside I would say is that it it adds time to your workout. So you're probably gonna add like 15 minutes to your workout, uh, you know, by doing something like this. But man, and then talk about like improved range of motion for the next workout. You get, you know, now you're not connecting to the range of motion like you would with, when you're doing like priming necessarily, mm -hmm. but it's also not necessarily passive. So, well, it's a bit how we kind of programmed uh, some ways the, the cool down process in prime. It's, well, that's yeah. what we did in prime. So, we had those static stretches to really reinforce positions, especially like, uh, you know, end range positions because we didn't want you to lock up uh, from uh, going through the workouts and being. <laughs> being sort of formed into that. Yeah, dude. It, but it feels really amazing. I, I've done this before where I've gone through stints of doing it. And again, the, the, the reason why I don't do it consistently is the time factor because it's adding extra time. But I've modified my workouts recently to reduce the volume to allow for the space to be able to do this. And it blows me away. And I'll, I'll keep you guys posted. But I know every time I've done it, I notice like this kind of muscle, you know, building boost from it that is uh, unique from adding exercise or volume because again it doesn't take away from my recovery you know mm -hmm. what blows me away is how you have not been kicked off twitter the same way you were kicked <laughs> off <face. laughs> I'm, I'm trying to how, how how have you how are you still on twitter right if, now if sal ever had a filter it's it's definitely no more no well yeah, you went not. okay so we still haven't got to the bottom of instagram i know we had some lawyer working it out trying yeah. to figure things out like i i don't know if you just gave up and said fuck it or whatever but you decide to go over Twitter. Twitter, you become this uh, like alter ego version of yourself and go 10 times harder. It's, I love it. And how are you not getting kicked off on there? I don't think What's I'm big theory? enough to, to, to garner attention. Yet. Oh, I'm wondering if you have to get a certain size and then the, you know, the people yeah, you're in significant right now. <laughs> yeah. The algorithm isn't picking. At some point, <laughs> at some point they'll be he's like, Oh, he's not a threat. Yeah. Yet. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we got to shut. The no, you know why? Because uh, when I got kicked off Instagram, I started from scratch. And um, luckily for us, our social media really doesn't contribute to our business at all. Thankfully, I know some people who build their entire businesses yeah, yeah. on like Instagram, and I, I, I feel so bad dependent on it because, honest to God, getting kicked off Instagram, I did not do anything crazy. It wasn't anything, yeah, crazy. No, I was very still objective. A mystery. Like I go way harder on Twitter. So if you see me on Twitter, it's like well, that is not what I did on Twitter. They on seem Instagram. to be doing weird shit like where they go back. You mentioned before where like That's what were, happened to me. You're getting like old stories. Well, even the you know you sent that thing about me in our private group. Yeah. That's dude, that's like 2 3 years old. I know. Yeah. 
That's he's hella make, old. He was making threats to me. Yeah, I know. I you know what? Okay, I so said, here's how ridiculous <laughs> yeah, this is. Yeah, get Adam yeah. off of here. Oh, we have a private forum, and Adam, <laughs> this was like a two years ago. At least that. Adam did a comment that said something like, hey, if-, if I uh, said if our if we don't have, if this isn't one of our biggest programs or launches, I'm going to punch Justin in the dick. Obviously yeah. joking. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously joking, because he would never punch Justin in the dick. But I got incited with violence, yeah. and three years two later- Two years later, three yeah, years later. what the fuck? I don't know if they changed the algorithm, and then it goes I was bad. confident I wouldn't get punched. I don't, yeah. I don't no, but on Instagram, it's what happened to me. I got all these uh, warnings for story, and the story disappears after 24 hours, so it's not even up anymore. But I would get all these warnings for stories that I posted two and three years before, and I would I was getting them every day, and that's when I told you guys, like, oh, they're after me. There's going to be something's going to happen. Yeah. And then these like copycat accounts started popping up, and they would they were like coming after me, and it was really strange. So I don't know, I don't know, you know, I'm not trying to be conspiracy theorist about it, but. Uh, but it's definitely very, um, very interesting. But yeah, on Twitter, I go, I go a lot harder because I started from scratch. I was pissed off getting kicked because I don't like being told what I can and can't do. And yeah. I get it. Instagram's a private company, so I don't think there should be laws that force them to do anything. But I'm like, I'm starting from scratch. I'm going to go so hard from the So what's the latest in terms of uh, Elon Musk's takeover and like, how is that process all moving? Dude, so I he got interviewed on the All In podcast. They're, they did their summit in uh, Florida, right? God, I wish we would have went to I that. know. I should have gone. Um, love those guys. I really. I'm trying to. I'm trying to get Jason Calcanis's uh, attention because um, I, I know they're all in the Bay Area, and I, I'd love to have the guy on the show. Um, he wrote a really good book on angel investing. It's really, really good. But anyway, they interviewed Elon, and Elon, the deal is on pause because he wants confirmation on how many fake accounts are on Twitter. Mm. Now, the public filing. Here's a funny. So Elon based this information off the public filing, which you're supposed to be accurate. You're not supposed to lie. And the public filing says that they estimate about 5%. Well, he comes back and he says, I'd like to see the numbers because it seems like it's way, way more. more. Than that. He thinks it's probably like 10 times that much, uh, as much as 10 times that amount. That would be my sense. He too, thinks it's yeah. like- 50%? He thinks it could be as much as 50%. He thinks wow. it's like 20% is probably on the low end is what he was saying. Wow. And he's like- Well, I want you know, I believe that after, you know, you made that comment. Uh, about I forget whose page we were on. I think we we're on Tom's page or some of that. You're Every like, comment was a bot, bro. Have you seen? Did you see our last one of our last ones? No. Our one of our last posts on the Mind Pump Media. It's, it gets hitting our Mind Pump Media page now. I think you just reached a certain level. Once you get over like a hundred thousand people, yeah. and you're and you actually have a lot of activity. These people that have these bots, they they go after those pages, mm -hmm. and so I, I we we're getting bombarded. With, we and, don't have any fake followers, and you know but we're getting bombarded with that. I think it's just there. there there's a lot more on the, these platforms. And the challenge is, it reminds me of steroids in sports and professional sports. People are like, we want you to get rid of steroids, and then the organizations are like, we're going to help get rid of it, but we really don't. But also, because, it helps us. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> these these social media companies, they don't want to. All of a sudden, reveal that you know thirty yeah. percent of their users are fake. Their numbers go way down. The stock price goes way down. Yeah, they get mess less money for advertising. So Elon said that Twitter, the way that they make money off advertising is through brand awareness. They're not like other social media companies where companies post and then make money off of sales. He said mostly on Twitter, it's brand awareness. And he goes, and that's a big deal if you have a lot of bots because you don't have a lot of real people looking yeah. at your brand. He goes, it'll, it'll basically it'll crush them. And so he said to them, yeah. I'd like to get some confirmation. And then Twitter responded and said, there's no way for us to know. Yeah. Well, the CEO, <laughs> the CEO came out. I saw that tweet. The CEO and, and he, came out and said uh, that it would be like an invasion of privacy because they cannot tell the difference between a bot and a real person <laughs> that they would have to go into their personal stuff in order to verify that. Therefore it would be like an invasion of privacy. It's never and, stopped them before. And Elon posts just the, the poop emoji yeah. or anything. Yeah. <laughs> well, he, dude, on the interview, he said that. He goes, he goes, it's apparently it's more complicated than the human soul. He goes, he goes, <laughs> he goes, it's what? like, it's like harder than getting to the moon. He goes, is trying to figure out these bots. Like basically he's saying like bullshit. He's being yeah, sarcastic. Yeah, okay. Bullshit. Yeah, sure, you guys yeah. don't. Because here's the deal. He paid a price based off of their public filing and what they say to the public. Right. If it comes back. And it's so like, you can get a reduced price. Dude, how probably, gangster yeah. would that be? Well, if, you're buying a broken yeah, but how, company. Hey, oh, how yeah. gangster would that be if he he did all of that knowing that 
knowing that when they started to dig deep, they were going to find that they were overinflating their numbers, and then they would they would either get in trouble or have Just to reduce value the hell yeah, out reduce of them the and then price bail and like, a, like a super discounted price. Dude, How yeah. crazy would that I, be? I mean, this is crazy. It's opening up a lot of- Well, that's going to open up uh, looking into Facebook, Instagram. I bet you like that's a big problem. Huge. With, with all these social media it's a companies. Huge, it's got to be a huge issue, especially if you yeah. build, if you pay for advertising and expect X amount of people- to look at your brand yeah. and you're like, wow, this, a lot of these people are fake and it's prime for foreign entities to come in yeah. and incite, uh, extremism and you yeah. Know, well think shit. about all the, uh, fake, like upset people that like, uh, seem to dominate the social media space. Like if that's really like, say that's like 80% fake people, just trying to get a rise out of everybody in terms of like rallying uh, people towards these causes. And it's not even real. Uh, like to me, like, like what does that say about society right now? Where are we? I don't know. It, it's, it is interesting, but I mean, I think an easy fix would have been, Hey, if you want to start a profile on Twitter, show us your ID confirm who you are, and then we'll give you a verified account. I think that's the only way to solve it. It's the only way yeah. to solve this. That's it. Is that you will, people that want other people to know for sure they're real will have to give up like their driver's license or give up something that yeah. verifies who they are. And then what it'll look like instead of only like super popular or famous people getting verified, everybody who's real will yeah. be verified. And then anybody who didn't go through that process and attach an ID to, uh, right. to a, a, a profile will not have access anymore to that. Right. It'll be interesting to see if they if he does something like that or they or they enforce this or not. And then what will follow Facebook does that. You have to log in, you know, <clears throat> attached like you're a real person. Like it has to attach to something. Do you? Yeah. I don't oh, think I didn't so. Know yeah, that. your your email. Like it, it and it has to like yeah, verify. But, that, but that's not Anybody can make a Gmail account really quick and attach it to. I mean, you could have yeah, 50 there's, accounts. There's been ways I've tried though to like think, create another account and it's. Blocked. I think Justin's oh, right. Really? I think yeah. Facebook. If, if I'm, if they're I'm, a lot more. Uh, I, I think they're the hardest one. Yeah, yeah. Like Instagram, super easy. Twitter, super easy. Yeah. To make just fake crap. TikTok, super easy to make. By the way, TikTok, <clears throat> very interesting. Uh, Jake Shields, you guys follow him? You know, yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, he's, he's, awesome. he's interesting. He said, "You know what's weird?" He goes, "I feel like TikTok." pushes like because because obviously if you own a platform you can prioritize certain content he goes i think they're promoting the most extreme crazy crap and he goes and tiktok's owned by china he goes i wouldn't be surprised i mean i'm i'm, I'm paraphrasing or whatever but i wouldn't be surprised if tri china is trying to use tiktok as a way to mess with the kids and yeah, all that stuff propaganda i would dude i mean i don't know man some of the craziest stuff i've seen that goes viral is on tiktok well they 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 display a completely different tiktok in china than here they do. Yeah. And they can't even use other social media and stuff. They, they shut it off at certain hours. I so know. It's what does like, that tell you? Yeah, exactly. What does that tell you? And they just play a different TikTok. They have a here? different. Bro, you can't get on Facebook in TikTok. China. No, 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 TikTok, not Facebook. Oh, yeah. They have it's the their, that's theirs. So I would but think they that, screen it. So yes. it's not like a bunch of stupid ass <clears throat> challenges where people like light things on fire, or, like destroy bathrooms or do all this like reckless shit that they do on TikTok. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's different. Hmm. I know, isn't that what that tell you? Yeah, it is weird. I'm That's not on funny. that one enough to have too much of an opinion on it. Like, I, I mean, I know that we've got it's somebody doing literally ours fast now. food junk. Like people just sit there and like scroll, and it gives you like 15 seconds of bullshit. Yeah, like, there's nothing to it. It's like there's like uh, very unhealthy behaviors being promoted. You know, with with kids and food and their bodies. I mean, that's social media in general, but. It seems like it, it prioritizes the craziness to put it at the top of the algorithm or whatever. Do you think it'll get popular ever for kids to kind of like not be on all this stuff? I think if it I becomes, so. I think if it becomes so cool too. to not to, it will. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I I agree. Kids are funny like that, right? They are. Yeah. Whatever's cool now, hundred percent. Cool there's continue. there's a yep. there's a popular kid in elementary or high school right now who's like I'm gonna be again instead of being someone who's on TikTok, who's on Facebook, who's on Instagram and cares about. I'm not going to give a fuck. And, he's soon, got, and he or she's got that confidence. And they're and mysterious. That yeah. And everybody wants to be like them. Like that's all it's going to take. He doesn't even have social media. Yeah. yeah. It's going to take more. It's going to take. The a, second girls prefer to date boys that aren't on social media. That's, that's, <laughs> that's going to change, right change the whole landscape, dude. <laughs> I remember. We got to start promoting that. Dude, hey, yeah. my Somehow. relationship with my my white tank top, you know, that's how it started. Like I wore them because I was a kid. And it's, you know, that's what you put <laughs> on your girl kid. Just said something Some girl's wrong. like, wow, you got really nice shoulders. And, you know, whatever. It's like, that was it, dude. I'm wearing this bad boy all the time. Hey, do you guys see that I, I bought some for uh, my baby son? 
Oh yeah, dude. Oh, the little mini me, dude. <laughs> he He's ran- a tank, man. He's, <laughs> he eats everything. Huh? He runs around in that little his little white, you know, beater yeah. or whatever. Just and push in, lift. He's and stuff. built, bro. He, he's gonna be. He's gonna be stocky. He, yeah. cra- he cracks. Yeah, me he's up, definitely dude. gonna be built. And he likes like uh, like we give him sardines. He just loves. Them. I know. I couldn't believe he was smashing the sardines like that. Oh yeah, dude, loves them. Absolutely loves them. We he's haven't so- even tried some of that. Although Max will eat almost anything, so I. But You're I right. I, I don't eat you. sardines though, so I don't. I you won't, he'll eat what you eat. Yeah, so you he, ain't touching sardines. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a big sardine <laughs> fan. So, but I mean, so good for him. So it's yeah. awesome that you guys got him doing yeah, that. Yeah, and I'm, I'm on. I'm on. I finally like switched to the you know like the super get shredded strategy now for myself. Now I'll ask you, Adam, because I know Justin could care less about these types of things. <laughs> Let's have a conversation. Yeah, over yeah here. No, it's fine, dude. Justin's like he's yeah. about to roll his eyes. Yeah. Out. But did you? Were there things that you would do when you would finally make the switch? That has nothing to do with getting you lean, but just certain things that you would do to, that would psychologically. Of course. But like, do you have I anything? Have tons could- of things. Yeah, of course. No, I mean, I even had like, I mean, I had phases of music. I had. Uh, when I would reach certain leanness, I would allow myself to get tanned. I would trim, <laughs> trim body hair. That's, I would like, that's I, what I just did. I do all kinds of weird shit. That's what I just yeah, did. I, like it's, it's a weird, uh, I don't know. I, and I, I don't know. I didn't get it from anybody. It's just something that like, I play these mental games with myself of, okay, when I reach this level, then I'm going to get tan. When I reach this level, totally. then, I, then I'm going to shave my wax. It's just weird because, it, and I think all it does is it gives me these little milestones and then it's- It re- sets it, them in the space. Well, it also, <clears throat> it, it reinforces the the look, right? Because we know that for every shade darker you are, you look a certain percentage leaner. Like yeah. they've, they've proven that, right? So- getting tan makes me look even more leaner. So I'm like, okay, I want to be pasty white, work real hard, get to a certain point. I get to that point, And then I'm going to slap the tan on it and feel really good. Yeah. And, then it's like, <laughs> and then I'm all hairy all over the place. And it's like, okay, I'm going to trim all that down. That's going to make the muscles. It's like a weird, Bro, game. I, I used to just, do all kinds of weird I shit. I just like did that. that annoyed the shit out of Jessica too. Oh, so really? yeah, she, we were, we go to bed and I take my shirt off and she's like, ew. I'm like, what? She goes, you look like a boy because I trim nice my chest. <laughs> She's like, I'm not trying to sleep with a boy. I'm like, babe, like, is it trimmed know? or is it shaved? Shaved. I trimmed it and then I shaved it oh, and then okay. I let so it grow out a little all bit. Out. Yeah, okay. but that's just it. And I don't care. I could care less. You guys know that. I'll let myself. But it's just mental. Like I now I'm in the space. Like it's time to get shredded. I mean, know? I I really think that. Um, but she just maybe there's a there's a me. difference between staying kind of fit and healthy, which is where I'd kind of consider my category right now, and then getting like shredded. Like getting shredded is such a is it, to me it's less. You have to be consistent. It's less physical and it's more a mental game. A hundred percent. So all those little stupid things you can make fun of me all you want. I think that those strategies are some of the things Dude, that would help the, me. The difference between me walking around at like nine to ten percent and getting down to six percent is this: nine to ten percent is eighty five percent of the time I eat really well. Fifteen percent of the time I enjoy the burger or you know the the dessert or whatever. Six percent. It's ninety nine percent of the time. Do you know what a pain in the ass? It, it, like how much mental? Like it's hard mentally to be like that on the weekend, at night, at the day. You're traveling. You go somewhere to eat. You have to. So I have to mentally put myself there. Otherwise, it's like forget it. No, no. You know. Yeah, stupid. yeah. I mean, I even have certain clothes that I wear when I get to certain phases. Like I'm super. The weird. sleeveless shirts. I mean, out. I've been doing. The, I've been. <laughs> I did that long enough that you you start to have to. I don't. know, You don't have to, but you 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 tend to start to do things like that. Yeah. To kind of keep you focused or pushing because it is. It's a that like exactly what you said. Getting down to nine percent is one thing. It's just like a little bit of discipline, a little bit of sacrifice. You still have good balance in your life. It's mm-hmm. not like you're sacrifice you get down sub six percent and like it th- and that's the reason why i don't think it's healthy long term because no. you're you're not living much no. <laughs> you know what i'm saying you're you're literally like your thoughts most of the day are centered around your eating it's and just your planned training. everything's planned. yeah you have to be and i'm doing it for a couple i'm doing it really because it's for fun but also um you know we're and i'm not going to reveal too much but i'm going to be in one of our upcoming in the future programs so i want to look the part type of deal he's and, modeling you know, and have fun with it. Shit, yeah, that's I hate that. Some little bikini briefs. <laughs> yeah, totally. Stay tuned. <laughs> That'll that's, we'll sell zero cover, <laughs> zero programs <laughs> if I do that, bro. Oh, man. Anyway, did, did you Fly guys? The did, did you guys see that? Uh, okay, so scientists have now created mouth haptics for VR. How does what? that work? Yeah, I know. I'm like, I, so you feel so the article you taste things or you feel things? Yeah, okay, in your mouth? so I so. I, the article I read had this image that didn't show the girl had anything in her mouth. It actually looked like a weird thing on the headset. 
But the way the article explained what they have figured out is they had figured out these mouth haptics that will allow people to feel the sensation of drinking or eating in virtual reality and or wind blowing on your face or like if you were flying or things like that. So you're going to feel that sensation through your mouth. What a trip. Yeah, That's I wonder, crazy. I wonder, I wonder what the first applications of that are going to be. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, you don't even have to guess, bro. I'm sure it's not going to be <laughs> pretending to eat. You no, know, the, yeah. Water, wind. People. Oh, spiders. Oh, oh who, what the hell? Who would want that? Hey, that would be a good trick what? to play on your friend. Hey, watch this game real quick. I mean, oh, I, the, the closer and closer we get to this, the more and more I think that, boy, did did they really hit it out the park with player one. Oh, it's so good. I yeah. mean, I just think that we that is really, really close to it. I mean, maybe not the whole dystopian, like, you know, everyone living in trailers stacked up or whatever like that, but the idea of we're going to have these body suits and goggles on, and it is going to feel... Like you're in there. You I know mean, what I, I was We're thinking, not far from that. Dude. No, I know what I was thinking. They got gloves now too. It'll so happen in our lifetime for sure. Oh, I, yeah. I was thinking the other day that, because um, one of the challenges with shopping, shopping online is that you don't have the experience of actually shopping in a store or trying things on. Mm -hmm. I, you could totally do that in the future with these haptic suits and stuff because it'll have your body measurements. Well, that's it'll have part everything. of that's You'll why, walk through the store, put that's on That's why clothes. Nike and these guys are doing yeah. that, why they're already buying into it, into the virtual world yeah. because that is exactly what they expect is going to happen is, and okay, it sounds ridiculous, but there's a lot of people and you guys have to have, you, I know you guys have to have a, a best friend, a cousin or someone of yours that lives three plus hours away from here. Sure. And you guys have similar, you guys like the same sports or you like certain things. And like, you can now go attend a concert or you can go shopping at a place with them. Like, you can't tell me there's not a lot of people that would totally eat up. Yeah, that meet up with someone. Yeah. You know, you call your friend up on the phone and they're, they live in a different state. Bro, is that they go like, get... hey, meet me at the Nike store. Yeah. Let's go shopping for some sneakers today. Do you know what else? Remember Demolition Man? When, mm. uh, with, with Sylvester Sloan, where oh, he's like, he gets like frozen or whatever and goes in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they remember when they're going to have sex and it's like, oh, we don't do it the old fashioned. It's gross. Like we had to plug it's ourselves. Just simulated. In. Yeah, dude. That'll yeah, get promoted as safe sex. sex. No, no, we're not touching. Just put on the haptic suit and then we'll have sex and no one's going to get any STDs or whatever. I bet you. Lame. I bet. I know. <laughs> I, know. I do so it old lame. school. Yeah. You know, <laughs> the old school way. Anyway. Lazy. Hey, I got to tell you guys something pretty, uh, pretty cool about uh, our sponsor, Viore. So when we started with Viore, what were they? What were they valued at when we first started with them? Uh, like a hundred million. Yeah, they're billions now, right? Yeah, yeah. I think they're they were either two or four billion, is what they. So, get. so we had we had some friends visit, and um, Jessica's friends were coming to visit. And when I said hi to them, I was wearing you know Viore or whatever, and she's like, "Oh my god, I love that company. Are you <laughs> sponsored by them?" I'm like, "Yeah." She was like a huge fan. Dude. We go to San, so we go to Santana Row because uh, she wanted so bad to go to the Viore store there because she's uh, yeah. like. And it's just crazy to me how much that company has yeah. grown and how it's like, and I went into, so Lululemon is across the street at Santana Row. So Santana Row, for people that know, is this like open air, you know, kind of high-end shopping mall. mall. Viore is across the street from Lulu. Viore, 15 people in their shopping. Lulu, three. Oh, wow. Yeah, mm -hmm. dude. And it's, it's, I, I, and I, it's the cooler. I think it's cooler. Because I asked her, I said, what do you think of Lulu? She's like, I like them, but I like Viore way more and you know, i walked through the store and it was full, full you know people. what's funny about that too i've had a few experiences where uh i'll meet somebody and then they're like oh is that your like i thought they were like oh are you the one of the hosts on mind pump it's like no oh that's viore clothing yeah <laughs> that's that's oh, i love that clothing i do too yeah no i, I got <laughs> yeah. this pulse so I, i'm you know i'm trying to get more of these kind of collared looking shirts i mean look at this i like yeah I like it's that. great I haven't I haven't got any of those. Yeah, yet. dude. But I couldn't believe their store was so busy and in Lulu was was not. Um, I wonder how much of the market share they've started to eat up. I mean, obviously Lulu was the leader in the athleisure they're world space. They're exploding. Every time I read about them, they're just exploding more and more. And the, now they're 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 grabbing the female market because obviously they started with men. They're really grabbing the female market and uh, just blow. And they obviously they do. It's one of those things. Job. Once you buy a pair and you wear them, then then you're all in. It's totally. just it's just the making that leap. Like I'm guaranteed there's listeners right now. Like, oh, I've been meaning to go try some of their stuff out. I haven't done it, and you kind of hesitate, hesitate. Yeah. And you finally do it, then you're like, oh shit, this stuff is really totally. Nice. Hey, speaking of our sponsors, so you know how I've been trying to cut caffeine. By the way, are you are you back on caffeine? You are right. Uh, so I'm having a cup in the morning. 
So I, yeah, my morning cup. And then I actually, I was just talking to Doug about how much it's been helping me because Doug, I guess, is coming down off of his caffeine also. You too, Doug? Mm -hmm. Where, where and, were you at, by the way? Because you didn't have much to begin with. I mean, 150, 200 milligrams a day. Oh, so that's not Not, not a lot, yeah, yeah, yeah. but... Not like Justin or I. Yeah, I was up to no, 400. Like These guys were like in the 600 probably range. Oh, I was like six, 700. Justin's like over 1,000, dude. Yeah. yeah. He's thousand. like... He's, he's, <laughs> he's trying to downplay it, dude. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've, I've tapered off a I'm little bit. I'm pretty sure he has an IV at his house. Yeah. He, <laughs> he pours <laughs> coffee in his eyeball. Yeah. yeah. You know? I stop but, uh, it at least by like one o'clock now. So, no, I'm, uh, I'm so on this like uh, element with red juice kick right now. So I've been, I've been on that. I, it really, I can feel a difference. Bro, so yes. So I tried cutting... You guys know this i tried cutting caffeine we're up in Truckee, and i was like forget it dude i'm depressed and, and zombified or whatever so now i'm using so red juice the things in red in the organifi red juice that help are the rhodiola and the cordyceps both of those have uh stimulatory properties but not like caffeine it's not really a cns stimulant but it helps offset the symptoms so here i wrote down the strategy i've been using and it's i'll tell you the feeling that it makes me feel is i i've put my finger on it because i've consistently done it now is Right now, because I trained myself so consistently to have a cup of coffee uh, on the drive over here. And then when I get here, I was having an energy drink or two, mm -hmm. right? So when we get ready to podcast, I have this like almost anxious feeling. So I, I feel unsettled. Mm. So it's a really weird, like, and and I want this, this caffeine. Obviously, I've been trained. I've been trained myself to want it all the time. And when I take the red juice, it just calms that down. energy calm yes yes so, so, I, so I, d I don't feel all sleepy and tired or i like i need something to give me energy and i don't feel all anxious feeling that it totally settles me down so here's what i did so this is for anybody who's trying to come off of it so i, I sat down because i'm like i do not like when i feel like something has a grab of me and i felt like well, i tried to come off caffeine i thought it'd be just go cold turkey and i'm like ooh, i don't like it's a powerful drug caffeine is a legit drug it's got it's deadly at a relatively low dose. You get classic withdrawal symptoms. Your body adapts. Well, the, it's addictive. So, so it's it's and, and I don't like the fact that I felt like it was it had a hold of well, me. Well, the right? reason the the reason why I, we celebrate it so much. That's why. Oh, it's I mean, it's, it's in, so celebrated. It's like, in kids' sodas and drinks. Dude. Oh yeah, I mean that's it, what every yeah. It's, I mean it literally it, and it's happened in our lifetime, dude. If when we, we discovered were, when we were kids. Coffee wasn't like a thing. No. Like now, like everybody drinks coffee now. And it, it's just, it starts with that. You have one cup and then you have two cups. Yep. And then you got to do sh extra espresso shots. And it's turned into like this thing. Like, I mean, I see people post posting all the time bragging about how many espresso shots that they have to put in their coffee. And because all the studies show the, all the benefits of caffeine, there's not a lot of negative stuff that comes out as far as we've just everyone goes it's a bell curve caffeine has some benefits but then it's got some real bad detriments and if you use it long term it, it stresses your body out so it's good to go off that's a fact 100 percent. and you're right when we were kids jolt cola remember that yeah that was the high caffeine drink i think you know, it had 80 80 it's all sugar. no it was like 60 million yeah it was not even a, yeah it wasn't even 100 was that's not even a small red bull yeah. uh, these days which who the hell drinks that no anymore? the real coffee drinkers were like the bus drivers who were like smoking cigarettes and like ah like oh, hating yeah. life like that's driving right. this shitty <laughs> or or, or your teacher i had a teacher that would yeah. just on breaks would smoke and drink coffee and then she'd come help you with your work and just breathe on you like, oh. <laughs> anyway <laughs> yeah so i so here's what i did i sat down and i said okay i want to create a, a a caffeine, an, a caffeine strategy where I bring it down and minimize the shitty feeling that of coming off. So here's what I did. I did a staggering approach and I incorporated the red juice because I noticed it made a significant uh, difference. So I was at 400 milligrams of caffeine on average a day. So here's what I do. The first day I cut it in half, go down to 200 milligrams of caffeine, add red juice. Day two is 100 milligrams of caffeine, add red juice. Day three, I go back up to 300 milligrams of caffeine red juice, then to 200, then to 100, then back up to 200, then 100, 150. Now, why am I doing the staggering approach? Because every third day or so, I get the wonderful effects of being sensitized to caffeine and it's a break because it does suck coming off. Now, this is like a 10-day strategy, but at the end of 10 days, I'll be down to 50 milligrams. Eventually, I'll go off. And then the plan is to go off completely for probably four or five weeks, then reintroduce it again. And I'm going to say, and here's the other thing about caffeine. It is an amazing, wonderful drug when you're sensitized. Yeah. When you haven't used it in a while and then you have some, it's like the greatest antidepressant energy producing 
thing in the world. I feel so. the same way about weed. Weed's the same way too. You have to same yeah, thing. Yeah, same you, thing. It's like it's just such a, a an amazing, powerful thing, especially for like creativity and relaxing and body numbing. Like yes. if you have a chronic pain, like such a powerful thing. But if you chronically use it every single day and you pick mm -hmm. up the dose on that, it loses its luster too. But you pull off of that for a week, and that's all it takes on on that stuff. What I love about that is it's so much easier than caffeine. I can cut smoking weed out for caffeine. You feel yeah, caffeine terrible. Yeah, the caffeine I can feel it. Uh, like that was rough. This yeah, and it's one. it's hard because if you have a job uh, or you got responsibilities, like I can't be depressed zombie and come do the podcast yeah. or you know yeah, hang out with my kids. <laughs> like they're gonna pay the price with my withdrawal. So that's why I did that strategy. But the red juice totally. And again, it's the rhodiola and the cordyceps is is what does it. it totally uh, mitigates the a lot of the effects. It's not perfect. You still feel like you're not, you know, like you're going off caffeine, but it makes a, a big difference. Yeah, you know, yeah. God know? bless you guys. Doug, will you look something up for me? I put it up in the notes, like I think it was last week, and I've, I've been meaning to bring it up, and I forgot who is trying to buy the rights. Or, so Dr. Seuss is, there, there's, I think they're up for, they're, 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 they're getting valuated right now so they can potentially sell the rights. So very similar to like Marvel and like all. Oh, really? Yeah. Imagine doing, uh, have, getting the rights to Dr. Seuss and then doing like all kinds of like crazy series to that. Interesting. Series. Yeah. I think that's really interesting. What company? I, I don't. So they are getting their company valued. I think they're oh. positioning themselves to get acquired hmm. or get or get the rights bought. So, that's an empire. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Huge. Yeah. yeah. Are you I mean, kidding me? The amount quite a few of those like. Uh, Pixar looking movies. I don't know what the difference is, like the studio that makes those, but they've made a bunch of Dr. Seuss based like type movies. So yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Good. I mean, it's good storytelling, right? Yeah. I, say, I love Dr. Seuss books. You know what that says, Doug, or is it telling you? It's a lot of information here. It is the number one literary license in the US by print sales. Wow. Like oh, Dr. Wow. So imagine yeah. how massive that could be. I mean, yeah. billions and billions of dollars. Well, right? and then imagine how like look at what we see the, what we've we've learned, like what the you know, Disney can do with things like the, the Star Wars and the Marvel thing like yeah, that and then build on characters with that many written stories around Dr. Seuss. Imagine how much they could build off of that. That's massive. It's huge. It's like, um, I mean, it's, it's a, it's, it's American royalty. You know, there's some brands that are just like Star Wars is like that. Marvel has kind of become like that. Yeah, I would put Dr. Seuss up there with that. Yeah, Dr. Seuss is is uh, it's royalty. Like you own that, you own a piece of American uh, history. And so you can do say that again, Doug. The most the most sold written literature. What did you say? What? It's the number one literary license in the U.S. by print sales. Wow. Yeah. So it so sells more copies than any other IP based book, period. including for both children and adults. That's crazy. Right, that's got to um, be. I mean, again, it's got to be valued at billions. Oh, it'll billions. be it'll be billions for sure. So that's why it's interesting, right? To see, I'm so curious to see, and I I know like people that are up potentially looking at Netflix. I think is looking at it, right? I think Amazon's looking Comcast, at it. Comcast, Warner Animation Group. Mm. Uh, yes. Oh, hey, I wanted. To, did you guys? Are you guys watching all this like revelations on the or, the BLM organization? Oh, I just saw something. I don't know if it's true though, so I don't. I, it's all. It's true. It, <laughs> you're like it's true. <laughs> it's true. It's it. true. Well, first of no, all, no, I saw. Okay, first I saw they're buying mansions. Okay, yeah, then they're yeah. throwing parties, like th tens of thousands of dollars parties. And then it just came out that the leader, the the girl, the founder, whatever paid her baby daddy, right? So the guy who has, she has a child with. $940,000. For creative services. For creative services. Paid her brother 800 and something thousand dollars for security. Se yeah. It's, it, and you know what? I, I'm going to say this right now. With donated money. Uh, yes. Yeah. It's, it was an admitted Marxist organization. They said that themselves. They were totally taking advantage of people's empathy and fear. What a manipulation. Race baiters. Bro, is the, what they cra are. the crazy part about that is like how extreme that is. Like you could pro she totally could have got a, like away with like eh, paying maybe a hundred grand or something like that to some things like Bro, that. When and, the just whole and justify paying a yeah. million dollars to your Listen, you know why? <laughs> so it's like I'm gonna get away with it. You, and you're not gonna do anything about do it. Do you know why? Mm -hmm. Think about it. Do you remember okay, you guys remember when all that shit went down? NBA, MLB, NHL, freaking uh, every major corporation. You couldn't say, uh, no, BLM is a Marxist organization without people just coming after you. So she felt invincible. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they'll never come after us because they were shielded with this, you know, we fight racism bullshit, it's which you don't. the whole ideology. Yeah, everything. and then people gave them money for two reasons, and I'm going to call people out right now. One, because you're empathetic, and that gets manipulated. Politicians do that all the time. And two, a lot of people 
just virtue please, signal, bro. Please, God, look yeah. here. I donated. I'm not racist. Don't right. hate me. Don't whatever. There's this weird sense that you had to like do specific things to prove you're not racist, which I was always like, this is crazy. No, it's bullshit. I remember when we felt the pressure when everybody's like, you got to post this on your thing. And we're like, no, I'm not going to post anything from this organization who just literally said, that they are part of a philosophy that's killed more people. It's a collectivist philosophy. That's racism is collectivism. Okay. Marxism is collectivism. It's all connected. It's bullshit. It's total bullshit. So, and it's, it annoys the shit of me. So now of course people are kind of waking up to the fact that they donated money to a bunch of, um, exploitive, you know, fake baloney. It's crazy to me. That's not making like front page news and headlines to me. I mean, it's you guys starting share- to, Really? Yeah. Is it coming out like that? Because I is. feel like all the articles I found and like very few people I knew even knew about it's it. A, you know why? Because a lot of people are embarrassed. You know, how many people were like, yeah, like, I, you know why? Yeah, because how mad are you going to be donated all this money and you see a, where it's dude, going? Bro, hundreds of a, millions of dollars. Yeah, a lot. Hundreds of millions of dollars. Like that's infuriating. Yeah, and I get the sentiment. Uh, I What's, think that's why so many people okay, got there's manipulated. Gotta be some, like, there's got to be some things that they did something, maybe. They, I know they painted some streets. They show up and organize maybe uh, protests or they'll speak out or whatever, but no, they really what don't. What happened to donating all that to college, uh, you know, and like like grants and, and doing things like that to get, uh, you know, people more more into that realm of education opportunity? You just have to be careful because the, easy, the, the two easiest manip- ways that PUA get manipulated is through your empathy. And your re- the reason why empathy is such a nasty thing to manipulate is because you feel like you're doing something good. I'm helping. So you'll fight that tooth and nail, right? And then fear, obviously. Scare Mm. the shit out of you. And the way that they manipulated people through fear or the way that we all kind of got manipulated was, oh my God, everybody's getting attacked if they don't support this organization. By the way, I'm talking about the organization, not the sentiment. Uh, The sentiment's totally different. I'm talking about the branded organization of BLM. They were full of crap and they manipulated a whole bunch of people and now starting to how many mansions they bought and all that stuff with that money. Come on, dude. And they don't pay taxes because it's a, yeah, it's I a saw you, I saw you posted about that this morning. How's it going? Is you, are you getting mad heat for it? No, no. I think people are just, a lot of people are like, yeah, I feel shitty, you know, for oh, you think people are aware. Yeah. How, I mean, how mad would you be if you were all yeah. about it? And then you read that she paid her brother 800 something thousand dollars for security and her baby daddy, you know, almost a million dollars for cre- what the hell's creative services. Mm-hmm. What the hell does that mean? Well, you know I feel like the last few years is logo been opportunity driven, right? <laughs> it's like anything that's out there you can make money on, it's going to press full throttle. Down. Oh, yeah, totally. Anyway. How much we pay for our logo, Doug? Did we pay close Not to a million? Not quite a million, <laughs> a little bit less. Logo. <laughs> and by the way, I don't care if it's your money and you want to pay your your whatever friend tons of money, but I do care when you lie and you, you use well, that's donation why, money. Well, yeah, that's why dude. I said, like, okay, if, if it was a, a little bit more reasonable, it probably could have easily got brushed under the rug and been like, no big deal. Like, I mean, you you can make the case that you need security. You can make the case that you need somebody for creative sure. design and some things like that. But to pay him a million dollars is like a little... Well, this is how some of the televangelists went down, right? Totally. Like, it's the same thing. Like, they just end up like totally like misusing the donations and they go back to rally more donations and it literally is funding their bank accounts yeah. and, and everybody else. Well, I feel bad. I mean, the whole, sh- the whole situation was shitty. I felt really bad for... <laughs> look, I have a lot of friends that are police officers. Do you know how hard it was to be a good cop mm. when all that shit went down? When the whole defund the police, which right. by the way, nobody supports that now because everybody knows it's a terrible <laughs> it idea. It doesn't work. <laughs> uh, but do you know how many like good police officers I know, good people, these are people I'm related to, friends of mine, like these are good, genuinely good people that are like, man, I'm getting like, people are trying to spit on me. Like I, I, this, I, got, I became a police officer to fight this kind of garbage and I'm getting hammered for putting my neck out there to to save people's lives. And so I thought that was terrible. Well, terrible. you know, speaking of con artists, you know, we, uh, we were off air. We were talking about HBO, uh, how good the content that they've been producing. Did you guys, have you guys seen the, um, the big con yet? No. Oh, uh, pull it up, Doug. It's called, I'm pretty sure it's called the big con. It's on HBO max. Uh, I just started watching it. It's like oh, a yeah. four or five part. The same people who did the McMillions. I was super sucked into this last night. And I, I think I got through two or three episodes of this dude. But he's like, I forget. Maybe it'll pull up the town that's like some small podunk town in middle of nowhere. And this Kentucky dude, is it Kentucky. Yeah, becomes soup like one of the most famous lawyers ever. He's a social. He ends up being a social security lawyer. And what he he becomes infamous for is the ability to get people their basically their social security insurance 
within 30 days. The process normally takes like 18 months for the average person. And this dude had worked deals with judges oh, and, wow. and he's on like every billboard. I mean, just, he becomes super famous, super freaking rich helping out. And it's like this category that nobody pays attention to. So for like over a decade, this dude got away with this like scamming people and making tons of money off of this. And then he got caught and he's in big trouble. Uh, well, so I'm not at the final of the show. I'm in the middle of it right now, but you just reminded me talking about people conning people out of yeah. money. And like, I had to bring this up. Like it's so far, it's interesting as shit. I had never heard of this dude before. Have you seen the preview for it yet, Doug? I saw the preview and I wanted to watch it. Yeah, yeah it's, it's interesting. Yeah, you guys will like it. It's super interesting. Dude, whenever there's lots of government money, you see some of the worst cons. They go in there and they get that mm -hmm. free... You know, and that's, it's, it makes you wonder too, like, because we have so much government involvement with so, so many things like that. That's all it takes is someone like this to figure out the system. Well, you know and what exploit it is. It. And by the way, be celebrated. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. this dude's helping people out I that know. are on social security and helping them get their money and stuff like that. Well, you know why? It's because when you try to rip off a, a private company, they're, they are, they really, their best interest is not in losing this money. It's their money. No, -uh, we got to watch things and you can still con companies, but it's much harder. When you con government, they have all this money that they give out. And the more they give out, the more they get, because each time they do their budget, they look back and say, oh, well, you didn't use all this money. You don't need as much. So they're encouraged to give this out. And so it becomes this kind well, of- Well, not only that, but there's so much bureaucracy and so many levels and people yep. between things that it's so easy to weave your way. And that's what he basically proved is like how easy it was. Oh, man, to, that's all you needed to know was, all you needed was like a best friend as a judge to sign mm -hmm. off on something. You're doing good for people. So no one's going to question it. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. And so he was just pumping the these- hustle. Yeah. Oh yeah, it was, yeah. The, it was such a hustle and it was clever as shit and everybody was celebrating. Yeah, you know? totally. So oh, super weird. wild. Hey, I wanted to say, uh, talk about a little success with uh, some of my family members. So, you know, you know how hard it is to convince family members in particular to adopt uh, like fitness or health strategies. And, you know, you kind of just give up and wait for them to ask you at some point yeah, because yeah. it just they don't listen. Well, well, some success is that I've got family members now that it's part of the routine to wear their blue light blocking glasses before they go to bed uh, yeah. an hour before. And they notice a difference and they do. And it's easy and they do it every night. And they're like, I sleep so much better. So the next, now I'm trying to get my my grandfather and my and my grandmother to use it uh, as well. See if they'll, if they'll Did do you it. start buying it for everybody as gifts? I tried to do that and I, I got to follow up, but I'm not sure it's like they're, it's successful yet. I, you know, that's the thing. Like I'll do that with like, like I've done that before. Where I'll do things for people and then they don't do it and I get my feelings hurt. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, forget it. But no. Wait till they're ready. I got people, that's like that. Now that's like their routine. And they're like, yeah, you know, I do the thing that you said. Do you do you think that's easier or the, so I, I was listening to, um, we're getting ready to interview Kelly, right? She's coming on the show. And so I was doing my homework on some of the stuff that she that she talks about. And she was talking about the, you know, finding um, very, very simple hacks to integrate into people's life that with, with very little resistance. Yeah. Right. And that's like a simple thing. Right. That's you're not telling them they have to do something radically different. It's like, hey, dude, when the sun goes down. Yeah. Just put these. Yeah, they're clear. Of, yeah. Put these glasses uh -huh. on. Or what she was actually talking about was the, you know, the salt lamps. Yeah. You know, instead of using your overhead light, using these salt lamps. I feel rooms. like that's a harder step. So that's why I'm at, what I was just, a, what made me, why I brought that up is I was, I was list, I was listening to her. I'm listening to you right now talking about that. And I'm wondering like, what do I think is uh, easier? I think the glasses for me are, it like, is because I keep them in like the areas where I have either television exactly. or by the bed and they just sit right and there. And everybody watches TV at night. Yeah. Who do you, who, I mean, I, everybody I know <laughs> watches TV before I go to bed. So instead of saying, don't watch, don't, don't turn on electronics an hour or two before bed or put salt light, you know, uh, lamps on or, or just use candlelight. Most people are like, no, I love my routine. That's, I agree with you. Yeah. I, that's why I like the, the blue blockers better is it's like, okay, I can put those on and there can still be fluorescent lights on, or there can still be the computer on. Exactly. Now I still try and discipline myself to, cause we have those Amber lights or whatever to yeah. switch the Amber lights or to have the fireplace on and kind of do that instead. But if I have that on, I'm, I'm less worried. I'm less worried if I look at my phone, I'm less, but if you do the salt lamps, but then you're on your laptop or you're watching TV yep. and you're doing all those things, I feel like it kind of defeats the purpose. Totally. Yeah. Cause every, again, it's an, it's a routine. A lot of people enjoy it. Oh, I put the kids to bed. I've got an hour and a half. I want to watch TV with my spouse. And now you're telling me I got to turn off electronics. Like I want to keep doing that here. Put on these glasses. You know what else we did is we bought, Jessica bought these red light bulbs. Have you seen those? So she put them in some of our, our 
bedrooms like red red or the amber ones that i'm talking about they're I, like the kind of similar to the no 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 they're red oh. so and they're made to minimize the effects of light because it doesn't have blue or green light in it so you turn them on now again that's also not as easy because who wants to walk around in, in red light you know all over the place or whatever but we like it you know we do it so at night if we turn on light it's just kind of a red glow versus uh you know versus the Are bright your neighbors worried you, there's some satanic cult <laughs> yes. that was like when i remember the i told you guys <laughs> yeah. the jew the first when i first got it when i used to yeah. live in the, saw it come through the window? To, yeah when i used to live in the con dude those things are so crazy i, to, oh, I told you he showed me a picture bright. of my house yeah. i'll never forget this i shared it on the podcast years ago when i lived in that i had that three story and we had it up in our spare room and the juve light was so powerful and my walls were all white that it reflected the whole house. So the whole house glue red. Yeah. So he was, he What's was going on in there. Yeah, yeah. So he took a picture and it was just like this, like, you know, it was after dark, right? It's so like eight o'clock at night. Summoning, but what's his name? Yeah, Bopet, yeah, like, oh my about. God, that's got to look yeah. so weird. Hey, if you're walking by. Do you remember, do you remember when Alex Jones snuck into, it was like this Bohemian Grove. Yes. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Do you know that's real? Yeah, he snuck into this Bohemian Grove. Apparently. Now that's the that one was, where all the politicians and super yeah. wealthy people go, and they 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 put on the fucking yeah. bullhorn thing, yeah. and they dance. And they, around there was a big effigy of of like the satanic. They, they pretend like, like they're drinking blood, and they and burned shit. it, and then they were all around it chanting. It's and like he, this big owl god. Yeah, or whatever and he is. filmed it, and it was like a real thing, dude. He actually it. got in and filmed it. He yeah. did. He, yeah. it, you can watch the video if you go online. Now, does he, he say- He was a reporter back in the day. And yeah. so he, he was like kind of exposing a lot of the things. It's the thing is like, everybody just wants to like write him off as a quack right away. But he started out as like an investigative journalist. Well, some of the shit he says is real. That's yeah. the part that sucks. Yeah. Because you hear him and you're like, wait a minute. Well, the, he proved like the CIA infiltrated a lot of like peaceful protests yep. just to make sure that like they could come in. What about and arrest the everybody. what about the human pig chimeras? And then mm -hmm. they're showing in China they're doing this with the, you know, it's like pretty crazy. But that one was the wildest because it was literally yeah. film of these wealthy, you know, successful, yeah, all the elites, connected of. elites gathered around this big effigy of their god or whatever. And wearing weird shit and chanting and singing yeah, like to robes it, robes and everything, and yeah, and it's up in Northern California, so yeah, it's like way up north somewhere, uh, you know, in the redwoods, and like heading towards Shasta or in that direction. Up, yeah, super Eureka, high security. Kind of Nobody area. could get in. He snuck in and took it, and uh, had death threats and stuff afterwards. Apparently. Yes. Now, yeah. when he was in there, did he say total eyes wide shut kind of shit? Did they say? Did he say who was there? Did he, did he uh, drop names? Do you remember? I don't know. I think he might. Yeah, I'm sure he's he said like because that to me that that that's the part that has to like because there's yeah. weird there's lots of weird people doing lots of weird shit. Yeah. Oh no, like, I think I no, think to me, there's, there's, there's presidents and ex. Yeah. yeah so to me, yeah, like, like if you got there. like really famous and prolific people in in government and in you know maybe the you know entertainment industry and they're all in cahoots and they're doing shit like that. Okay, that's a little weird to me. But I mean, weird shit happens all the oh, fucking yeah. no, time. No, no, no. This, weird people do lots no, of weird this, shit. These, like, in order to get in there, you have to be super connected. But imagine, imagine this. Imagine if you built a business. You crush, you become a billionaire, and then like some super connected politicians, like, hey, you yeah. know, come hang out, dude. We're gonna have a party, and then you walk in, and there's like fake dead bodies made out of food. I imagine you've seen in some of these well, things dude, started. So who who's the author for like Huck Finn and you know that series way back? Mark Twain. Mark Twain. So Mark Twain was actually uh, attributed to like starting this, I believe. Really, you know, Mark Twain? Fact, fact check me, Doug. But yeah, like it started out as sort of this like. Um, this this like sort of group of all the the celebrities and powerful people and whatnot and they were able to kind of get away from society and and have their own little party yeah and I mean, everything goes what would you do though thing. if you showed up to a party and you're like oh cool I'm gonna be I feel like out you get uh like I don't, I don't test you yeah yeah I don't think you get jumped right into that you know what I'm saying I think you get like little bits of things like hey do you think this is cool yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know you're at the party and yeah maybe them. this is where they gather yeah. a bunch of blackmail on yeah. the powerful people have you heard of like the, Epstein have Island, you heard of the knows? regenerative properties of children's blood excuse yeah. me what never mind never mind no no big deal yeah no I'm just kidding bro like what why can't I come to the party we changed we canceled it we're not doing the party anymore. Yeah, so I, I, I'm sure that they, they probably, uh, they, they probably don't jump straight to the crazy party. I'm sure they get like, like a little bit of like breadcrumbs for. You know <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> they're willing to yeah, hook you're, line. You're not allowed down because you can't. I imagine you can't afford to bring somebody in who is going to rat you out background check everybody yeah sure, i bet yeah. it's it's probably you probably got to apply and you probably know all about it in order to get in it. I bet. I mean, that's what I would. What assume. does it say mm -hmm. there, Doug? 
You know, I'm not seeing definitive statement that says that Mark Twain started it, yeah, but okay. there are some suggestion that he did. Look up Bohemian oh, okay, Grove so and, then, anyway. and then go on images. Put uh, put Alex Jones Bohemian Grove and look up uh, images and then you'll see a picture of them like praying to this. I mean, weird... this is Google, Doug. So if you really duck, duck, go it. Yeah, there. Uh... Look at that. <laughs> look at that, bro. They're like burning shit and wearing weird oh, yeah, stuff yeah. and praying to this weird. Come on, bro. It's big That's old some... owl. That's yeah. some weird shit, dude. It's a trip. Imagine if you saw that and there's like presidents, ex-presidents and... Well, it would be weird if I saw presidents and ex-presidents there. It wouldn't be that weird if I just saw... I mean, because Just like a I bunch said, of Northern California people? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, just Silicon saying, Valley. Like, yeah, and they're all, on, they're all on shrooms yeah. and they're doing their yeah. thing. It's, be like, oh, it's a normal... It's Wednesday. I mean, come, yeah. on. <laughs> come on, dude. We have people have that group we session, are connected yeah. to in the health and fitness space that are so into the fucking shroom side of, you know, fitness right now and... You know, chanting and war painting and freaking yeah. doing weird shit too. So it's That's like, true. and yeah. if you were outside, no idea what's going on, you walked in and you see these guys screaming at each other and pounding each other's chest and like wearing thongs and paint on their face, or laying and, down. Hey, there's like one guy is like laying down yeah, and he butthole sunning. Yeah, his, his, come on. His, his body was outlined in crystals. You know, it was all around his body. He's like, oh, and they're like <laughs> yeah. chanting. I'm like, well, I mean, you know, teach their own, I guess. Yeah, dude. So but, there's lots of. It, but you're right. It would be weird if it yeah. was like ex presidents. Yes. Yeah, like, like, so connected. that's to me, like, that's when I see things like this, I don't right away go, like, oh my gosh, there's plenty of people that. No, do I think there weird, were. I think Satan there were worshiping stuff. Really, really interesting people at this. I don't, I gotta, I gotta look at it. I know. I, so I remember when Joe and him had this conversation. So I did see that, or at least I've seen clips of him talking about this. And I do remember him saying that there were pretty famous people that were there, but I don't, I mean, I don't know how much that was confirmed and you know, how much is that? Like, just like we hear now, like, it, like the big thing now is like, were you on the plane to Epstein Island? You know what yeah. I'm saying? So like, well, it's, dude, it's it, like, it's the whole like conspiracy theory with yeah. all these people getting Even together. If it is confirmed, they'll put this information out, you know, yeah. to, to make you question yeah. it. Or they all sit together and they talk about how they can manipulate the world. We're going to, first, we're going to release this virus and then we're going to like, oh, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, stupid, dude. That's not what happened. Yeah. Oh, That's not what happened. I'm just God. saying. Could you imagine? Uh, Crazy. <laughs> Hey, real quick, we're going to get back to the show, but you got to go check out Organifi. In this episode, in fact, I talk about their red juice. It's one of my favorite products. It contains rhodiola, contains cordyceps, and also compounds that help with blood flow. It's a great energy-producing drink. It's non-stimulatory, so it doesn't have any caffeine, but it does give you energy. But they have many other products, like a vegan protein powder, which I love. They have a green juice, which is great for health. They have a gold juice, which is great for right before bed. Much more. Go check them out. Go to mindpumppartners.com. Click on Organifi. Use the code MINDPUMP for 20% off. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Shannon from California. Shannon, what's going on? How can we help you? Hey, thank you for taking my call. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Um, so I have a two-part question, but firstly... Um, I've been wondering about how to eat properly in a surplus. I'm kind of trying to like work up the nerve to reverse diet. And um, if I'm metabolically adapted, do I eat at my surplus of what it should be to like build muscle or, you know, it, like let's say I maintain 1400 calories a day. If I bump that to 1600, am I actually going to build muscle or do I need to work my way all the way up to like 2500 so that my body you know, can kind of make the other systems more efficient and then start building muscle. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, okay. So a couple of things when you, when you go into a surplus, so you want to go, a surplus is going to be quite individual. So you want to kind of figure out what your maintenance is. Uh, if you know your maintenance mm -hmm. is 1400 calories, a 200 calorie bump from there is, is a safe place to go. Now there's two things to understand when you, with calories, um, or at least with how many calories your metabolism will burn. You're, you have a range with your current lean body mass in terms of calories burned. So, you know, think of it this way, like your current lean body mass could burn, and I'm going to just make up some numbers, between 1,400 calories a day and 1,700 calories a day without adding any additional lean body mass. Now, what determines if you go lower or higher? Your lifestyle. So are you sending a muscle building signal? That makes a big difference. Do you have a lot of stress? That makes a big difference. How's your sleep? That makes a big difference. Hormones will make a big difference. So you can bump your calories and see no weight gain whatsoever. In fact, that's that that's relatively common. I'd say about 50% of the people I work with when I would increase their calories a little bit, they just would get more energy and they'd feel better, but we wouldn't mm -hmm. see weight gain. Now, how do we 
turn that or get that to go into muscle, you have a great, effective, appropriate strength training routine. If we put you on a really, really good strength training routine, then you're sending this muscle building signal. So your body wants to build muscle. It's got extra calories now. And the, it'll, it's likely that it'll take those extra calories and build muscle, which then will, of course, speed up the metabolism even more, which then will lead to your ability to add even more calories from that point. Does that, does that kind of make sense? Yeah, yeah. I just wasn't sure if I needed to like get myself all the way up to like 2,500 at maintenance, and then I would start seeing the results of the muscle building. Oh, I see. No, you'll start seeing results before that, although I think that's a good goal is to try and get yourself up to that. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a good well, goal. Go ahead. And that's sort of my following into my next question is, um, which I'm, I know you guys get this all the fucking time, but uh, is fixing the metabolism always the first thing that you should do? Because I have like 50 pounds to lose. I just had my third baby um, like seven months ago. So I can, you know, it's time I can start doing some training. Um, but it's like the mental thing is so hard. Mm -hmm. I know you guys know that getting from the idea of not cutting right away. So yeah. is there never really a case to like, cut right away so that I feel like better about myself and then reverse diet once there, I've first, leaned out. First of all, we should address this. So you, you don't have a broken metabolism, right? Yeah, thanks. Your, your, your metabolism has adapted to what you've been doing. So it's not broken. Right. And uh, is there a case where we have somebody, a client where I go right into a cut who wants to lose body fat sometimes, but it's more rare because this is what ends up happening many times. This most people have tried before they get to one of us normally, like when we were trainers, uh, they had tried to mm -hmm. diet and exercise themselves for months or years before they got to us, before they got frustrated enough to say, hey, I need to hire a professional and help. So I would say nine times out of 10, um, I'm almost always reverse dieting a client, even when they, so I'm always adding calories to start their programming off, even if their goal is to lose 30, 40, 50 pounds. And it's not because they have broken metabolisms. It's just that for an extended period of time, they've been in this very low calorie diet and, you know, many times have yo-yo dieted and tried exercise. Mm -hmm. And many times the exercise that they would, they would go after would be this high intensity mm -hmm. aerobic type of training, which is just, again, sending a <laughs> signal to that metabolism to slow down. So it's not that, it, you know, that... It, you we don't have cases where we cut calories and it's not that you have a broken metabolism it's just that the case normally is that people have tried to do this on their own the way they've done it on their own is restricting calories moving like crazy i.e cardio and then we get a hold of them and it's like okay you're at 1400 calories and you've got 30 40 pounds to lose i know that i can't i can't cut you from there like you're already lower yeah. than i want you're already lower than where i want you to be at the end of my 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 help so uh, the inevitable is to, yeah, absolutely reverse diet. Yeah. And it, we're, remember, we're looking long term. So we're trying to create because, you know, this is this is very true. Losing weight is is not hard. It's actually quite easy. The hard part is keeping it off. Everybody's mm -hmm. lost weight before. Um, I mean, millions of people do it every year. It's the keeping the weight off that is the challenge. And so we focus so much time and energy on losing weight, which is dumb because if you look at the statistics, people who try to lose weight, a majority of them are successful at some point to some extent, but the majority of them are fail at keeping it off long term. So why are we focusing so much energy on the weight loss? Why not focus the energy on how can I set myself up so that this is something that is sustainable? Now, is it sustainable to go from 1400 calories to 900 calories to try to lose 30 pounds? Probably not. I mean, unless you want to eat 900 calories for the rest of your life, um, that's, right. that's, that's a tough position uh, to be in. Um, you said you had a seven month old. Are you still breastfeeding? No, I just weaned. Okay, so good. That's that because that that can make things a little bit more uh, challenging. And then here's the other part. Yeah. You wrote this in your question, and, and you uh, you know this is the part that you wrote down that you didn't necessarily say, but you you kind of hinted to this is that there's this mental aspect. It's like you're ready to lose weight, and you're like, okay, I got to reverse diet and build up, and it's going to take longer. And you know, I kind of you know maybe you feel bad about yourself, or you're maybe a little impatient. You're like, I want to get this going. Here's the trick. Here's the key to that. Don't focus on the weight loss. Focus on all the other positives that you get from slowly increasing your calories and introducing appropriate exercise. Focus on all the other benefits. So you may not see the scale move down real quick at first. Remember, it's kind of a snowball effect, right? If you do this right. Mm -hmm. But what you will, no will notice is you're stronger. Your energy is improving, which is probably something that you're going to 
enjoy quite a bit considering you have a seven month old. So you probably have gone through a, a period <laughs> yeah. of not that great energy. So it's like, oh my God, I got way more energy. Oh my God, I'm feeling much stronger. My hormones are starting to feel like they're balanced again. My libido is kind of coming back. My sleep is better. My joints feel better. Wow, I'm really enjoying my workouts. And then and focus on those things and you'll you'll see all the positives that are happening right out the gate. So it's easier to deal with. If you just focus on the weight, well, yeah, that could be real frustrating. And, and what will happen is you'll ignore or not to pay attention to or give value to all those other incredible things that happen in the very beginning. And then, of course, eventually the weight loss starts to happen. And then it's a snowball effect. It happens faster and faster and faster. And if you do this right, Shannon, it'll feel effortless. What I mean by that is as the weight starts to come off your body, as you start to burn body fat, I used to, clients would tell me this all the time. They'd say, this feels really weird. Like I'm doing way less than before. I'm just getting leaner. This is really crazy. And it's really crazy to them because they'd never experienced what it feels like to have your body working with you versus against you. So Consi totally. consider all that while you're doing this because what you don't want to do, I'm sure you don't want to do this, right? Where you lose 50 pounds and then you keep it off for six months, then you gain it back and then you lose it again and you gain it back. And then over time, you end up, it becomes more and more challenging over time. Like, let's do this the right way. It might initially take a little bit longer, but at the end of this, you'll feel amazing and it'll be much more sustainable. So that's that's the 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 message that we're really trying to preach. Shannon, here. what uh what's your training look like right now? Um, so I'm actually doing anabolic. Um, okay. I'm kind of oscillating between days that I can get to the actual gym where there's barbell. So I use the at home program and um just the regular one too, just depending on kind of like what I have going on. Perfect. Um yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're, you're set. Stick to that. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. Those are good reminders. It's like, I, I gained like 60 pounds with each kid and I've lost each time, but this time I'm like, okay, I want to like do it right. <laughs> and so thank you guys. I really appreciate, yeah. um, no you know, problem. the reminders that to trust the process, I no, guess. No problem. And congratulations on the third baby. That's, that's amazing. Thank you. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> good for you. Thank you, Shannon. Thanks, Shannon. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Yeah, it's like, uh, boy, I use this analogy all the time, but it's like, you're like, I want to build a house. Yeah. And then, you know, the guys are like doing the foundation. Like, no, no, no stop doing that. I want to see the house tomorrow. So like, okay, no foundation. We'll just put up some wood and some sheetrock and here's your house. And then, you know, a storm comes by and your house is gone. So it's like, you got to, if you build the foundation right, you're going to have a lasting, a long lasting structure. If you don't, it's going to, you know, any storm is going to come by and blow it right down. Yeah, we just could get back to that delayed gratification. It's uh, the work itself is, is you know, what's going to carry you. And, you know, to do it right, you have the opportunity right now to do it the right way, which, you know, is going to be able to, uh, you're going to experience a whole new level of fitness that way versus getting immediate results where it's like, I lost weight and it feels great, but now you're in that trap of that hamster wheel. Well, now it's going to come back. Now I got to hustle to get it off and it's going to come back. Yep. And so why not just pull yourself out of that and, you know, really dedicate yourself to the right way. It's the mental aspect, man. That's so hard here. Always. Yeah. Always. I mean, I, Matt, I mean and I, I totally get it. Like imagine, you know, struggling with weight loss, having 30 to 50 pounds that you want to lose. You just want it gone. Yeah. And, and, and someone telling you to eat more, sounds counterintuitive. So it it's it go it flies right in the face of what you've been marketed to and it seems you, illogical. It, yeah, it totally seems illogical. So of, of course that's going to be difficult and then heaven forbid the scale actually goes up a little bit, you know, which is very possible. Sure. I, I know you said that, you know, a lot of people stay the same or end up end up losing, which if you do a good job of adding just the right amount of calories, you should see what you're saying. But it's not that it's not bad either if you go up three to five pounds. No, that that, that and that happens from extra water. That's or, right. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 you know, maybe you have a great you have great genetics with with building muscle. Maybe you have a hard time losing body fat, but you put on muscle really well. And so your body adapts and you add three to five pounds on the scale, but you've added some good muscle and you've sped up your your it, your metabolism. That's a very good place to be in. So yeah, it's a bit of a mind fuck when uh, when you're struggling to lose weight, but when you get somebody who's at 1,400 calories, I don't care how much you got to lose, whether it's 10 pounds or 100 pounds. Not a good place to be. Yeah. I mean, I know right away that I've got to get this person's uh, calories up because it's just not a sustainable place. And in order for us to lose, we have to create that deficit. 
And it's just not likely the amount of activity or the amount of calories they'll have to restrict is going to be something they can maintain yeah, and, for their life. And the, one of the biggest problems with this scenario is this attitude right here. You know what? I'm just going to lose it and then I'll worry about keeping it off later. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's like that never works. It's you are forget that you're not going to keep it off later. It's just not going to happen. So, you know, thinking about how I'm going to fix it afterwards, you've already ruined it by going through this process the way you did and you can't fix it afterwards. It doesn't work that way. Our next caller is Daniel from Texas. Daniel, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey guys, uh, really excited to talk, talk to you this morning. I guess, uh, I'll give you a little background just to, so my question makes sense. Um, almost 40, I've uh, been lifting for about four years, um, really just sorted through lifting myself, had no formal training, um, tried to sort through the industry information, which was tough at best. And uh, when COVID hit, it stopped actually lifting and, and started picking basketball up. I have an athletic background. So a bunch of us were playing through that. And I started straining my, my calf, um, both of them actually pretty bad. So I, I took a break as everything opened back up and started uh, another weight training program. Someone pointed me to you guys. Um, after listening to you for about a, a month, I bought bought your programs and started Anabolic. And I uh, actually saw really, really good success through it. I tried to play basketball halfway through and 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 pulled my, my calf again. So I stopped all together, but I ran the full program. Um, I saw great success. I went from 17% body fat uh, down to nine, added about eight pounds of muscle. Wow. That's great. Um, so, uh, so really, really thankful for you guys. And I, I'm a walking billboard for you guys around here. I've got a lot of friends and family that have started your programs. Um, but I started performance and I thought I addressed some of my, my mobility issues I did in my shoulder and in my back, um, used prime for that and it fixed it. So I thought I was doing some things for my, my calf, but I went to play again um, two weeks into performance and I strained it again. So I, I sent in this question because I heard Adam say if he was going to play basketball, he would he would design something so he wouldn't get hurt. And I really wanted to see what you guys would say, if there's anything I can do or if I, as I'm approaching 40, I just got to hang out yeah. my basketball shoes. Adam just rubs Ben Gale over his calves now. Stupid. <laughs> that's what <laughs> my dad does forever, dude. Yeah. No, yeah. This, one, this one's so close to home for me, right? So, uh, yeah. And, and honestly, okay, so performance is good for, like, general performance. And uh, it's good for working on mobility, the things that you've addressed. But when you start dealing with, like, calves or, like, Achilles stuff that I, I mean, I tore my Achilles playing basketball for this exact reason because – there's a difference between uh, working on your ankle mobility and then actually working on like explosive, explosive drills strength. and strength with your with your ankles, which performance isn't very specific to that. So although I would run a program like performance, I would definitely have some modifications for basketball stuff. And and you know who's got really good stuff? And, and why is his Instagram going to slip me right now? Corey Schlesinger's uh, Instagram name, Justin, do you know what it is? Uh -oh. So... If you, I don't know. Do you follow Corey? Have you heard me talk? Shout slash him out. Strength, I think. Yeah, like slash. No. I'll have so uh, you you up. got it, don't you, Andrew? Okay, so I'll make sure that Andrew puts it in the in the show notes, or he'll pop it up. So when you watch this, you'll actually see it. It is slash strength. S slash strength. Yeah. Okay. C a s c h l e s s. He's a good he's a good friend of ours, yeah, yeah. and he's the strength and conditioning coach for the Phoenix Suns, and he actually okay. also tore his Achilles. And then he, he he showed you'll have to go further back on his Instagram um, to to see some of this, but he posted a lot of really good rehab stuff uh, for uh, ankle strength and Achilles, like reactive training. That that stuff is what I would need because I've had calf and and uh, Achilles issues with, uh, and a lot of that I think has to do with. Uh, the muscle that I had built. So like you, I went on this like muscle building kick, you know, so I, when I played basketball, I, I weighed more like 180. Well, I walk around 230 now. Okay. And even when I'm in like lean shape, I'm 215, 220, which is way different than what my, my explosive basketball self is used to. That's the one drawback of actually put packing on a bunch of muscle is if you haven't trained athletically with all that muscle, then this is where you get these kind of issues with like strains in the calves, or in my case, tearing the Achilles. Is you've got all this power that you've built, but not this the same type of power that translates into sports. So I uh, make sure you check out his stuff. Also, another person. I know I'm plugging other people than ourselves, but to be honest, I don't think we have written anything that really addresses this. 
um, is our good friend uh, Paul Fabritz at PJF Performance, who has a bunch of training programs. I literally would would take from those guys if I were to build a uh, kind of a basketball training routine for myself to get myself back into shape. Yeah, really, it amounts to that that speed power. Uh, and there's just like brief elements of that. And I think it's phase four or phase three uh, of performance, but really like plyometrics and, and getting your your calves conditioned for that type of fast twitch response and that kind of uh, a demand and, and force generation there. Um, that's what you need to start, you know, scaling and, and being able to to work on improving. Uh, and they they and those are great examples that Adams w- was mentioning. They have like certain drills where they actually use assisted band, where you actually hold on to a band and you start, you know, working on that uh, time of of keeping your feet on the ground and explosively, uh, you know, jumping and bounding up. So uh, there, there's lots of like sp- sport specific type technique for. Um, this type of training that uh, you really need to dive into that part of it. Meanwhile, getting that type of uh, real, real foot strength uh, from, you know, from your barbell training as well. Yeah. I mean, the big rule of thumb here, Daniel, is that performance is, is quite specific in terms of how you train. That is where you'll get most of the performance. So if it's strength, Although strength has a lot of carryover, most of the gains in strength will be to similar movements, similar speed, that kind of stuff, right? So if you're playing basketball, it's much more explosive, reactive, and you're not doing any of that in your training, it, you'll get some carryover from strength training and mobility, but not a whole lot. So you're, okay. you're, you you want to do things where you're practicing some maybe controlled jumping, lateral bounding, jump rope can even help a little bit uh, for short. Uh, you know, bouts. Basically, you want to you want to practice the stuff that you'll be doing in basketball, just to get your body acclimated and get the the reactive strength, the stability to be where you want it, so that when you go play basketball, you don't experience what you've uh, what you've been experiencing. Yeah, toe squats. I mean, using the sled for sprinting, things like that, where you can be a little more explosive on your forefoot. So, you know, being able to <laughs> strengthen your feet is going to be everything, which will then help translate up the kinetic chain and get your uh, calves conditioned as well. Definitely dive through all the guys' stuff that I just recommend. They got all kinds of really good stuff related to what we're what we're talking about. I know at one point we've talked about getting more specific with like performance and addressing specific athletes, but I would take the base of performance and then I would start. I would add in some other drills yeah. uh, that I would pluck from our two friends who I think have start put, slow though. Yeah, you what you don't want to do is yeah. is do like a whole workout where you're simulating basketball because you'll just strain your calf again. <laughs> so I would do like a few <laughs> like a couple sets and slowly <laughs> progress yourself, um, just like you would with any other, or even just a couple skill. specific exercises. Just adding that into the That's routine, I mean. right? Just doing yeah. a couple of these these exercises that uh, Corey is doing on his Instagram, I think, would be extremely valuable to you and, and just building it up. But I mean, it's crazy how, um, and I know what it's like. I'm sure because you you have an athletic background. Um, and I didn't, I really didn't feel this till north of 35 up into 35. I really felt like I could be cold. Haven't played basketball in forever. Grab a ball, just a couple weeks of playing ball. I would be adapted and ready to go. But man, after 35, um, and I, you know, a a little bit of that is I think just getting older and not playing, doing a lot of these movements. I also think that it didn't help that I had built, built a ton of muscle since my third, my early thirties. So all those things are kind of working against you and I as as we age, and now it's just it's necessary. Mm-hmm. Like if I'm gonna go play basketball, or else I'm doing exactly what you're feeling. I'm feeling strains in my calves. I'm potentially tearing my Achilles. I rolled level three sprains in both ankles. I mean, I'm of the yeah. disaster after 35 when it came to playing basketball, and it's because I neglected this shit. Hey, Adam, was that second group PJAF performance? PJF. PJ Paul Fabritz, okay. he's like, uh, in my opinion, one of the yeah, he's one of the best most elite NBA uh, basketball coaches, and he puts out t- tremendous amount of free content that is incredible. Awesome, yeah. awesome. That's great, guys. I really appreciate it. I love your programs. Love everything you're doing. Really, really helpful. Thanks, awesome. Daniel. Awesome. Thanks, Daniel. There you go. Yeah, you know what it is. As you age, it's the your a body's ability to adapt in the positive slows down, but your body's ability to adapt in the negative speeds up. Right. So it's like, if you miss a bunch of workouts in your 20s, you lose some strength and some mobility and some stability, but not super fast. When you're 50, 
whoa, it goes away. So, I mean, I remember when I would train people over the age of 60 and they miss a month of working out. It was like they stopped working out for six months. Yeah. Um, so you just, you adapt in the negative so fast. And so if you don't play basketball for a year when you're 20, it's not that big of a deal. You don't play basketball for a year when you're 40. And it's like, you got to really prep and get yourself back to that skill. Cause everything you train is, I mean, any, yeah. every movement is a skill that you practice. Most of the gains you make in whatever skill are pretty skill specific. So yeah. even though you're working out in the gym all the time, if you stop doing these specific sports or athletic you know, endeavors, you, you got to get yourself back to them before you jump right in. Yeah, I think that when you're younger, you don't realize what kind of demand like a sport like basketball puts on your body because you're so resilient. And as you age, it's it's ever more evident. Like, yep. like strength is something you can keep and maintain relatively, you know, proficiently and, and also like, you know, muscle. But like in terms of explosive strength, athleticism, you have to do so many extra um, you know, movements and, and make sure that you're reinforcing your joints, totally. your ligaments, all these things like <laughs> before you just jump right back in um, because, yeah, your body just really needs to get conditioned uh, back in that type of like explosive demand. Well, I also I don't think that I I realized um, what a difference the weight was going to make because I was in like this guy, like, right. I was like eight, nine percent. I was jacked. How yeah, much more weight body, were you carrying? Yeah, how, about, yeah, how much more weight were changed. you carrying? Yeah. But my body, I'm carrying 20, 30 more pounds. Uh, yeah. Of course. Right. So yeah, of course, like right. Hindsight looking back. But I think that when you're a fit person like this and you have an athletic background, I think your thought process is like, oh, I'll just kind of take, and that this was mine. Oh, I'll get back. And what I used to have like this, the way I used to get back into basketball was who I played basketball with. Right. So I knew at certain times mm -hmm. of the day, like average playing guys <laughs> yeah, would play this time. Right. Well, here's but, all the old guys with the pot bellies. Yeah. Yeah. So and, and then, out. and then like, if you wanted like the ballers Saturday morning at like eight o'clock in the morning, yeah. like, you know, that's when all the collegiate guys come in and like, so like, I would, I'm going to work my way there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I would work my way. That was my way of kind of getting ready, but it didn't matter. Even though I was playing way easier my body still, when it was goes to go for a rebound or make a cut left or right, it it remembers what I did my entire childhood to move like that. But now I'm moving twenty to thirty pounds more, yep. and I haven't trained that 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 new weight of mine explosively. Right. And and it would be my ankles, calves, and knees. Yeah, well, you're also the decelerating part, right? Controlling right. that. So maybe you are stronger in certain movements, and maybe you're overdoing the force, but you can't, you know. Like slow yourself. Well, well you get if you gain twenty pounds of muscle through controlled strength training, most of that muscle is going to be good at controlled strength training. If you don't train it explosively, you just have a bunch of strong but not explosive body weight. Then you go to try to explode, and that muscle hasn't been trained in that way, so it just becomes a liability. Well, and I don't think I realized how I could do it to myself. Like I, you know, of course, you think as you get older, you're more prone to injury, but you still think of like somebody injuring you or you doing something stupid. I blew my Achilles. I had just laid the ball up, made the bucket, and then the guys the guys were going the up opposite direction. I turned and took off to go back the other direction and just that the deceleration like you're saying Justin down from the layup and the jump to the explosive oh. going the opposite direction. Yeah. And I literally thought that the guy behind me stepped on my my it felt like he stepped on my Achilles or intentionally hurt me yeah. and when I look back there was nobody there I was all by myself but that's what it just that was the pop but, oh. but I was all alone you know it was all alone and I wasn't doing anything crazy it was literally a layup coming down and then turning yep. and then going back up the court and the other direction full throttle the opposite direction. that's right our next caller is Mankyu from Canada Mankyu how can we help you um hi okay I'm super excited to be here but um, basically I'll just get right into it. So basically I just started a new job, um, at my uni as a personal trainer and like my clients have mainly just been like faculty members and students. So I've noticed most of them kind of have like come with like extremely like stiff hips, like rounded shoulders and often they're just unable to do like really basic things like squat to parallel, like comfortably or like lift their arms up overhead without any compensation. So as a result of that, I've just kind of been doing a little more, like trying to incorporate a little more mobility work within the sessions that we have. So that's often like 10 to 15 minutes at the very beginning um, like of our sessions, like twice a week. However, I've just kind of started to notice that most, um, most people just aren't as like excited about like mobility as like all the other stuff. And they're often chasing this more like, you know, like the cool stuff or the puppy birdie sensations, which 
like, you know, are good, but that's like not really want to be what I really want to be working on with them right now. So my kind of question is like, is there like a best way to implement mobility in a client's workouts? Just like, for example, like when, like, do I do it before a session, like in between breaks, how often, or are there like just any ways to make them feel more engaged and excited about mobility in general? I, I, I really like this question because for most of my career, what I, I trained trainers and one of the, the hardest things for them to do was to balance this what the client needs and what the client wants, right? Because there is a there is a part of your job, you're service-based, right? So they're paying for a service from you. And many times they think they know what's best for them and they're going to tell you what they want. And then you know as a coach and a trainer what's best. And so there is this little dance that you have to do. Now, as you get more and more experienced, I think you get better at communicating what they need to do and better at convincing them to basically follow what you say. But when you're kind of just getting started, this is a, a major hurdle. And so I understand uh, a little bit of the challenge. Are you, do you have any of our programs right now? Do you have MAPS Performance? Uh, I don't actually know. Okay. So it, like MAPS Performance to me would be a, a must for you. I think having Prime Pro would be a, a, a must because there's ways that you can build some of these movements that you know that they need into their routine without making like the whole day like a mobility day where they're doing more like corrective type of work and they feel bored so i i would pull from our maps prime pro program and then i would also utilize the the techniques that we have in our uh, maps performance program but this is a super common challenge that new trainers have and part of that is you getting better at communicating to them what they need that's that's everything okay, mm -hmm. look i'll tell you what man q the the you are talking about the most important skill that a coach or trainer will have is getting the the person to understand, to trust you, okay? That's the most important thing because, you know, Adam said, you know, balancing what the client wants versus what they need. They don't know what they want. That's just the truth. They think they know what they want, but they don't know what they want because they're unconsciously incompetent when it comes to fitness. That's why they're hiring you. So your confidence and your excitement is what they're going to read. Now, if you're not confident, I've seen trainers do this. Like, well, okay, but I think we should do this. Like, of course, the client's gonna, not going to listen to you. I didn't have this problem. I Probably a year into my training. Now, the first year I did because my confidence wasn't super great when clients would say, I just want to do this and I just want to do that. And I thought, okay, well, they're paying me. I should do what they say. Later on, I became much more confident and they just followed. And that's the goal. That's where you want to be. You want to get to the point where you're confident. You explain what's going to happen. Here's why we're going to do it this way. Oh, you just want to feel a burn in your arms? Well, you don't need to hire me then. Go get a soup can, go lift your arm up 50 times by yourself and you, you can save some money. Oh, wait, you want to get in shape? Then do what I tell you. Listen, trust me this one time and I'll never have to ask for your trust again. That's the kind of confidence that you need to display as a trainer. And believe me, these people want that. They want to hire a trainer and the trainer to say, listen to me. I know what I'm talking about. Follow me and I'll get you there. And the person's gonna be like, you know what? I'm letting go because I totally want that. I have no idea what's going on. I've tried doing this before and it just doesn't work. So work on your confidence and your excitement because that's what they feed off of. They'll feed off of that. I've gotten people to get excited about things that you wouldn't think people will get excited about because I'm excited yeah. about it. Like mm -hmm. get 90-90 on the ground. Like most people will be like, I don't want to do that. I want to run in circles and do jumping jacks and burpees. No, no, no. It's They would feed off of my excitement and I would make it intense and I would communicate what's happening to their body. And I would point things out to them that they may not normally identify. Like, did you see that we got your ankle to move up five more inches? How does your back feel? This is what's going to work for your body. This is why these communication skills are by far the most important thing that you can have as a good coach or trainer, because they have to follow you as their guide. That's ultimately what's going to dictate how long, success. how long have you been listening to this show for man? Q? Um, I think like two and a half years now. I'm not gonna oh, lie. Yeah, uh, two so. and a half years. You've been fucking listening to us talk, and you haven't bought Maps Performance or Maps Prime Pro or Maps Prime yet, and you're a trainer. She's a college. No, student. I know, I know. I I don't give me I that. It's fucking less than a gas of tank, bro. Come on, don't yeah. give me that excuse. Yeah. That's okay. Shame on yeah. you. Shame on you. Seriously, like this. You, you trainers are the ones I get most frustrated with that haven't made the investment in yourself to learn this stuff. Have, oh, if you look at the way our programs are written, they're written for coaches and trainers to learn. So it's not just to help people out with this stuff. If you go through it, you will get the resources and the tools. Now, look, you're talking to us right now, so we're going to hook you up for free, but shame on you. 
two and a half years of listening to this podcast. Almost for free. You just have to get shamed a little bit. Yeah, no, I'm gonna, I am, I am gonna, I am gonna fucking shame you right now because it's like this is. You, you, the question you have is a very good question. It's very valid, but it's very fact, common. It's very common. But the fact that you haven't taken the, the, a step to invest in any, or how about this? Watch our free webinars that we have. We have a free webinar. Okay, you've at least done that. Okay, thank yeah. God. Right. Thank God you've done less that. Less shame, less shame. <laughs> yeah. Still shame, but, but less. God yeah. damn it! I mean, use, <laughs> use the resources well, that we are we're providing you guys to to implement it in with your your clients. So. I'm convinced this is the this is the most value trainers even provide. I mean, totally. Like, like Sal said, like you can just rip something off the internet to to make you sweat and burn. That's the easiest part of of our job. What they need to be convinced of is that you have their back. Whenever you know, like you're considering all their joints function, you're considering pain in the future. You're drawing up this elaborate plan to get them success uh, long term, not just short term success. So, you know, it, it really just amounts to the, the amount of communication back and forth with your client, constantly educating them as the why, the why you're doing everything, why this yes. is setting you up for the next phase, uh, you know, where you're going to take them from there. So I'm always communicating with them and painting a picture and a vision of where I'm driving the ship. So, you know, this is just part of that. It's just a piece in, you know, in, in, in the formula of success for this client. So they need to do it. Yeah. Well, and, you know, the, the mundane is what's the, the hardest for them to do. And that's why you hired me. Yeah. Man, Q, think of it this way. Okay. Imagine if you're about to go through a dense jungle, you've never been through it before and you hire a guide and you tell the guide, I want to go that way. Cause I think that's the fastest. And they go, you're crazy. You're going to die. And alligators and eat you. Follow me. I've been through this jungle a million times. I know where I'm going. What are you going to do? You're going to be like, you know what? This person, they're really confident. I'm going to follow this guide because they know what they're doing. Now, what if the guide said, well, I mean, I mean, we can go that way, I guess, or we can go, you know, what do you, and you're going to be like, okay, well, I'll tell you what to do then. And then you, you're, cause I'm in charge now. It doesn't work that way. You're the trainer. Your confidence and how you communicate is everything. So they come to you and they say what they want to do. And you're going to say to them, okay, cool. That I know that's what you want to do. We're going to do it this way. Cause I'm going to get you there better, faster, and more permanent. Are you ready for this? And the person's going to be like, oh my God, I'm so happy. I hired a trainer that knows what they're doing. Yes. Tell me what to do. That's what people want. But if you don't have that confidence, you're going to get run over and then you're going to get a bunch of just order. You're just going to be an order taker, in which case you don't need to be a trainer to well, do that. And circling back to something that you said, Sal, that I think is really important. And I'm going to give you a, a real generic, easy thing you can do because you made a comment about clients, which are very common that can't do basic movements like squat all the way down to 90 degrees. You take a client, one of these clients that can't squat away down 90 degrees, you do a couple, set, four to five sets of some really intense, good 90 90s, and then some combat stretch and show them. Oh, yeah. Let, like they literally, you can change the way they move in fucking five minutes. Yeah. If you take a person and, and show, video it if you need to, or take a picture of yeah. what they look like, they're sold. And then, and then go watch what I'm going to do to you right now. And then spend five minutes doing 90 90s intensely, and then five minutes doing combat stretch. Then take them right back to that body weight squat and video them and show them look at how you were just moving before and after this is one time i'm spending with you doing this imagine what happens when we start to build a routine around this that you got so you got to use those tools like that to convince them to have trust and faith and that you know where you're going and then to sal's point again that it, it really does stem from your confidence and your ability to help them like that and part of that comes with you also learning and educating yourself and you know of course going through the programs that i told you so get yeah. your ass through those man q we're going to send you those two programs just because you took that beating from adam so <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you so much for calling uh, in okay okay i just before before we end like i know i'm like i'm like totally shame on me for not like not getting any of the programs but i just want to say like I've been listening to you guys for like two years and it's just like really it just transformed the way that I kind of like oh. think about health and fitness and like how I repri like how I've just kind of started reprioritizing like it's function in my life and that's just like that's what I kind of want to do for other people as well. I know, I know, like I know I totally should have gotten the programs the second I started listening, but no, we like, listen, we we get more we get passionate when we talk to coaches and trainers because those are our favorite. We people. want you guys to succeed. Yeah. You're, and, you're, and don't forget, there's yeah. three hosts here. You don't have to like all of us. Most people don't like Adam. <laughs> Stupid. But you can definitely like me and Justin. You're a it comes from a place He's of a tough love. It guy. comes from a place of love. Yeah. I, you're you are on the front line and, and it, it does mean a lot to us. Uh you guys are really the ones that we know if we help you, you have the potential 
potential to go help hundreds. So in real ways, that's yeah. right. So you know, it's cool for us to help some people out there that you know buy our programs stuff like that. But the trainers and coaches, mm -hmm. man, if I can make an impact on you. I, I can 10x that's, that's the amount right of people there. we can help. So that's, totally. it does come from that place. I promise. Yeah, we appreciate your support, man. Q. Yeah. Thanks for calling yeah. in. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Doug, did I, I didn't make her cry. Did she cry? Okay. I thought yeah. she was, I, you were <laughs> trying to, though, weren't you? <laughs> no, yeah, I just I get, I get so of frustrated course. with coaches of and trainers that. Of course. You it's, know? It, well, I mean, we listen, uh, man, I wish I had these tools when I first became a trainer. I really do. Um, they didn't exist. You had to kind of figure this out yourself or find a good mentor. Yeah. So we put the stuff out there. You know what we think about? This is just for the audience. Whenever we put out a program, the first people we think about are the trainers. That's mm -hmm. true. Now, we know we're writing it for the general population, but we think of coaches and trainers because that's our integrity. That's that's you know what we are. But this struggle, I, I mean, I remember having this struggle. And there were some clients that were harder than others to get to trust you. I remember specifically one guy. He was the biggest pain in the ass of all time. I, ho I, I hope he's listening. He knows who, I, you know who, he, knows who he is. I ended up training him for a while, Roger. but it, but initially he was the biggest pain in the ass and he would argue with me with every workout, but I just want to do this. But Sal, I just want, finally, I'll never forget. He told me one day and he goes, it literally calls me on his way to our session as he's late. He's like 10 minutes late. And he says, listen, Sal, just this one time I'm paying you just kick my ass. That's what I'm asking for. Just give me one session like that. I said, okay. And he, he showed up and I made him throw up. And I said, here, here's your workout. Is that, and 15 minutes later, he's out puking. And that was our session. I said, do you think that was valuable? Do you think you got great, you're going to get great results from that? And he's like, no, man, I, I think you're right. And I said, yeah, bro, you just wasted that session. <laughs> Next time we're going to do this the right way. But it's really tough. Uh, I can, I get that. But if you're confident, most people, when they hire a coach, they just want to trust them. They just want to be like, all right, well, you know here's what you're doing. the thing. We've put so much work in trying to, to, you know, catapult these trainers. So, uh, really like they're going to, they're going to bypass like decades of, of trial and error with their clients. Like we're, it's all there. And I think that's where the frustration is because, you know, if I had access to a way to look at it with, you know, a fresh, uh, trainer mind where I'm like, Oh, wow. I, I should be applying these concepts yeah. like right now. That's the thing. Because if I'm not, you know, then I'm just going to keep doing the same same things over and over again. I'm going to let the, the client dictate, uh, you know, what the session's going to entail. And, and the thing is, you do have to get educated. You do have to go through that, but you don't have to keep stumbling your way to get there. The, the content is there and it's valuable. That's exactly right. And it's not, it's not the buying the program that's going to make her the good coach. It's her taking the tools that are within the program and applying it to per person after person. And then she would have figured that out herself, what we just suggested, right? So we talked about the 99 in combat stretch and then being able to impact someone's squat. But just buying the program doesn't give you that. Taking the program and then actually applying it to the your clientele and then starting to see these patterns like, mm. oh, shit. Anytime I do this this mobility movement with someone, I notice their overhead yep. press is amazing. Yep. Oh, anytime I do this combat stretch, all of a sudden they get six more inches in their squat depth. Like, oh my goodness! Like you you have to first go out seek the the the, the information, the knowledge, and then you have to put it into practice. That's where the confidence yes. comes from. Yes. So like it, it's real easy for us to sit over here in our chairs and be like, be more confident. But it's like being more confident means you have to get out there and and apply some of these things that you're learning. It starts with making the investment in yourself and learning. That's right? part of it. That's the part where I was ranting about. Once you get that, then you go take that knowledge, go apply it to people, and then this shit starts to unfold for yeah, you. Yeah, but you know how many times I've seen trainers do the stuff that they know they're supposed to do, but the trainer seems bored? Of course the client's going to be bored. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a lot of trainers, look, I love training people heavy and deadlifting. And that was fun for me, but I made sure to dial up the fun act when I would do shit that I know that it for them is boring because they feed off that. If I'm bored with it and I'm not confident with it and I'm like, yeah, we got to do this. I know it's been you know, a mobility. It sucks. Like they're going to think it sucks too. So that's a big part too. Our next caller is Jeff from Connecticut. Jeff, what's happening, man? How can we help you? Hey, how's it going guys? Uh, wow. This is a uh, kind of surreal. Um, uh, been a listener since episode like 500. So, wow. Oh, wow. Uh, Back when we sucked. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for well, staying uh, with us. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, my question is kind of about that. You know, over the years, uh, I feel like I've heard you guys give tons of great tangible advice on 
way on um, different things you can do to incorporate into your workouts. Um, you know, like specifically, I think recently there's been a big, uh, big push for like sled drives. I feel like you guys talk about a lot, but also things like, uh, Indian club and Mace Bell and stuff like that. Um, so my question is if I'm following a maps program and I want to follow it, you know, basically as close to a T as I can, cause I've seen good results. What's the best way to incorporate those different types of moves that I feel like you guys, you uh, know, talk about the benefits of all the time. How long have you been following uh, maps anabolic for? Uh, I've ran anabolic once I'm in performance now. Um, okay. and, uh, so I was, you know, based on like the, the, the next round back through anabolic was thinking about trying yeah. to incorporate that's, or modify slightly. That's the, that's the way to do it. You know, this is the million dollar question. You know, there with strength training, there's, I don't know, 5,000 different exercises and probably three different ways to do each one. So it's impossible to program everything into every program. However, um, Adam, I know where Adam's leading. It's like, once you follow our programs to a T once or twice, you should have a, a decent grasp on how to modify for your body. So mm -hmm. like you use the example of the sled, where would you put the sled in maps anabolic? Well, I would on a, on a day where you're going to do squats instead of squats, do sled that day and see what happens. You know, it's a, it's a leg exercise. That would be an easy way. Uh, may spell Indian clubs. How do you incorporate that? Well, maybe you start your, before you get into your shoulder workout or before you get into your presses, you do a few rounds of may spell or Indian clubs, just to kind of get your, your shoulders kind of warmed up and stuff, you know, Turkish getups. Where would I put a Turkish getup? Very beginning of the workout, start your workout with a few Turkish getups, then get into your workout and see how it works or do it at the very end. Well, That's it also way to do depends it. on how you're using these type of unconventional lifts. Like, are you actually trying to load and make it, a, you know, a strenuous exercise? And, and that's something that I would actually, yeah, to Sal's point, re re replace an exercise with that. Or you could use them as primers, which is something too that you figure that out your own specific needs and routine from our our prime program, where you go through the compass test, you figure out mm -hmm. what zone you know you need to focus on the most, and so that's where a lot of times I'll pull. I needed more shoulder rotation, so I would do my uh, Indian clubs as a primer before I knew I had like heavy overhead lifts for that day. So you know, there's lots of different ways to uniquely incorporate these unconventional lifts, and they're very valuable. It just also revolves around the intent of them because you can load them and you can make them an actual uh, uh, strenuous type of an exercise. But now you're looking at having to replace. Yeah, this isn't there isn't a, a right or wrong answer per se in this because you can use this a bunch of different ways. How Sal actually ex gave the example is exactly how I use all the things you listed. I literally love to do the sled. So my favorite way to do sled when I'm running like an anabolic program is when I know I kind of overreached the last time I squatted. Like I, and I'm still kind of sore and I'm like, oh man, I, I did more than I need to, or I loaded more than I need to. So today I'm going to drive the sled. So I'm kind of giving my body a little bit of extra recovery because it's not as strenuous on it. And so I'm going to load it though. I'm going to load it and I'm going to drive it hard. So I'm going to get a great workout from it, but it's still no, nowhere near as demanding on the body as like a barbell back squat. So I love to replace that. Any and how I used to start the workouts, and I got that from Justin is the mace. I love to do mace and Indian clubs before I do any upper body movements. It's just a great, it's just a great primer for your shoulders, and the shoulders are incorporated in back, chest, and obviously shoulder mm -hmm. work. So when I go to do any upper body stuff, I love to prime that. And Turkish get ups, I actually, uh, I, I, you guys didn't suggest this, but I actually even like doing these on like trigger days or yeah. off days oh, yeah, that's yeah. A good idea. because it's not, it's not an exercise that you're going to get like really sore in one specific area. It's a, a, a total body type of movement. It's like a communication exercise. Yes. That's how I like this. Yeah. It. I think that's a good way to describe it. It's more of like a communication thing. And so I used to love to practice Turkish get ups on a quote unquote off day of like heavy loading and training and just work on my body's communication, like to Justin's point. Gotcha. Gotcha. So if I took this a step further and said, you know, like any type of, you know, exercise or, you know, any type of advice you guys give that, you know, I think recently you talk about the, the elbow position for like biceps and triceps. If I just, you know, take that and incorporate it where I would have done biceps in yes. another, you know, in another workout. And, you know, instead of doing just normal barbell curls, like try like Preacher curls or spider curls yeah. or something like that. Yeah, yes. totally. And also exactly. when you do, when you do the higher volume workouts, we we think we are that that'll be in there. Like if you did map split or aesthetic, 
<laughs> you're going to see the different elbow positions with bicep and tricep exercise. But MAPS Anabolic's a lower volume, more basic kind of routine, which is more appropriate for most people most of the time. Yeah. yeah, you could totally replace, instead of doing dumbbell curls, do a preacher curl or a spider curl or something like that, for sure. That's actually part of why I asked you how many times you've ran anabolic uh, and what you've done. And it sounds like you've done anabolic performance is all the things you've listed. We've actually incorporated into the other programs. Like, right, if you wanted like sled drives and stuff, I know you're going to get you're going to get some of that in like strong. If you wanted to do the only thing I don't think we've included. Have we done Mason Indian clubs? No, any, that's the only thing we haven't done is no, Mace. But, but that's no. a great I mean, that's, those are great for the, the mobility days on performance. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, Turkish get ups, sled work. I mean, that we, we do spider curls, all those movements. Those are those have been built into every program. So you do get a ch if you do go through other programs, you will get a chance to do that. And that's why we do it. We do it. So if you run through all the programs, you get kind of a taste of all these different movements. And then hopefully our, our goal always is whether you're a coach or you're just an average person going through all these programs is once you've gone through them, you get this full grasp of, okay, I get yeah. what these guys are doing here. And then you can do what you're trying to do right now, which is, Hey, I really like anabolic. It fits my schedule. Well, my body responds well to it, but I also understand the value the guys say of all these other movements. And so exactly what you suggested is a great way for you to implement that into anabolic. All right, cool. That's that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll take that, you know, maybe swap some things out with uh, some different movements, you know, get my hands on a sled and see where that goes. Hell yeah, man. Have fun with it. Awesome, thanks, Jeff. Thanks for calling in, Jeff. Awesome. Thanks, guys. You got it. This is the fun part. Uh, if you listen to our show and you follow our programs, it's, it's obviously it's going to be fun in the beginning because you're going to see your body respond like it's never responded before. But it gets really fun when you start to learn how to listen to your body and implement changes and individualize your own routine. This is when it gets real exciting because then you get to have some fun and individual. And nothing is – our programs, as good as they are, they're just not individualized. Mm -hmm. So when you get to the point when you run them once or twice – and then you start to tweak it for your specific body. Man, that's when things really get enjoyable. Not only that, I think this is also how you stay sane for decades and decades of training. Keep it interesting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, not to say like you can't, you know, enjoy one of our programs and, and cycle through them. But at one point, you mean, it would only take what to get through all of them a couple of years at best, right? Yeah. If that two years to get through, I don't know. I've yeah, never probably. done the math. Two years, two and a half years to get through all of them. Once you've kind of gone through all of them, like, you know, just to keep repeating them would probably get really old after a few years of doing that. I would want to be able to play with it, modify and take things that I learned from, you know, uh, MAPS performance, take things I got from strong. And I mean, that's literally how I train right now. Mm. My, my training does not look like a, a specific MAPS program. I take our philosophy and I love to mix and match totally. different movements that I'm interested in. At the well, time. yeah. And this is really what led me into unconventional lifts in general was just trying to seek a bit of novelty and something there that was, could maybe fill the gap to uh, some of the training habits that I had established already. And so like all those years of just foundational, you know, barbell training, it's like, uh, you know, to find certain lifts that had that the, those certain elements, you can't get a lot of rotation, especially with the upper body. Mm -hmm. uh, and so some of these that he'd mentioned were like such a, a huge uh, fit for me uh, that really unlocked even more potential I could squeeze. Uh, so there's just like opportunity for that uh, once you get through and, and create that, that base level foundational strength. Yeah, no. And look, if you work out and you do it right, it's a, it's an, it's a journey forever. And it changes and morphs depending on the context of your life and your body and what you're looking to do. And it, it never gets boring if you're really paying attention and never gets boring. It just improves the quality of your life. Look, if you like uh, the show, you like our information, you'll love mindpumpfree.com. That's where we have a bunch of free guides uh, that we wrote for almost any fitness or health goal. So go to mindpumpfree.com, get yourself some free guides to help yourself out. Also, if you want, you can find us all on social media and get some more content. Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can only find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal.